So I don't really want to finish price first because there's a lot more we can do, but we got to finish it up tonight. <laughs> so I want to end up with option strategies because options are a really, really powerful tool. How many, do y'all trade options, any of you? A little bit. So I traded options in my 30s and 40s. I had some great trades and some horrible trades. You learn from the horrible trades. You're just, you're killed by the good trades because that gives you confidence, which is the last thing you want with option trades. But option trades are incredibly leveraged. I've had trades where you know I'm up 40,000% in two days or something just crazy because you know, you've seen like NVIDIA stock. I had the numbers on GameStop. I have to show you GameStop's numbers. If you buy call options on that, you could have retired at 22. It was just, it was just incredible. My stock goes from $22 to $400 in a few days. Those call options go crazy. But that's the key with derivatives. So derivatives, options, uh, especially, but even futures and other, you don't have a lot of cash up front. You can lose 100% pretty easily with futures. You can lose you know, more than 100%. With options, most you can lose 100%, but you can be up 80, 90,000%. You're going to lose 100% a lot of the time, which sounds a lot like your car insurance, doesn't it? How often do you collect on your car insurance? Hopefully not more than once every five or six years. Life insurance, how much do you collect on your life insurance? Maybe once. But why do you do it? Why would you pay for something where you're unlikely to ever collect? It's That's the nature of it. We're going to talk about Taleb and Black Swans, where you're trying to benefit from volatility. You don't benefit very often, but when you do, it's massive. And that's a very unique kind of trade. That's what insurance is. And so I want to show you just the theory of options by comparing it to just long strategies, where you just buy stocks, buy buy. Uh, bonds. Uh, I don't like these strategies for young people. For young people, you're going to do options. Do it like you're going to Vegas. Just make it a trade, and then make sure you don't you don't risk more than 100 of your money. But for older people, I actually think 100 percent in stocks with options is a better trade than 40 percent stocks, 60 percent bonds. Now, I was a much stronger believer three years ago when interest rates were so low. I was like, why are you even buying bonds? It's just a waste of money because you're not getting paid even enough to keep up with inflation. But if you're to buy the SPY, which is the U.S. stock market, and you came in at $130, you could lose your money or make money. It's just a straight line. Your portfolio just goes up and down with the markets. So what older people do is they put bonds in there to try to bring that slope down because bonds aren't as volatile. Now, in 2022, that didn't work, right? Because bonds were down a bunch, stocks were down a bunch, so everybody lost. Treasuries are down 20%, stocks are down 20%. There was no diversification benefit, which is again, what inflation does to you, right? Inflation just kills all strategies, but it does reduce. But how much can you lose here? A lot. If you're 70 years old and you got to live on your portfolio the rest of your life, not knowing how much you can lose can be pretty, pretty dangerous. When you buy insurance, how much can you lose? Well, the insurance company is going to step in at some point after your deductible and you've got it covers. So what we'd like to see is the cut this tail off, wouldn't we? And how do we cut the tail off? Well, we cut the tail off by cutting some of this off. What we're trying to do is swerve this in by swerving that in a way that we still get a decent expected return, but we cut the bottom off. So essentially what we're going to do, if you think about it, instead of using bonds to change the slope, we're going to take the normal curve. We're going to cut off both tails. And cut off the extreme highs and extreme lows so that we can get rid of the extreme lows. All right. So let's look at some strategies here. So this red line is a pretty traditional hedge equity. I'll, I'll show you some actual numbers. You can notice it does much worse than all 100% in the stock market. But you got protection, but we're not comparing to 100% in the stock market. If it's your grandparents, what are they comparing to? 40% stocks, 60% bonds. How does it do versus that? It actually does quite well. So you've got a lot more upside when you do when you do the stock market 100% and options than you do when you have 60% in bonds. Um, especially three years ago, because what was your upside potential on bonds three years ago? It was nothing. 
you're not going to, if bonds are paying 0.5%, you can say, well, I hope interest rates fall 300 basis points. They're probably not going to do that. Uh, it, you know, they can go negative. Japan's been negative, but how negative has Japan been? Negative 0.1%. You know, bonds, when they're that low, they're not going to fall 300, 400 basis points. That was that 1980s when interest rates went from 18% to, you know, 7%. You can't see that. So, so I was especially strong on this three years ago. Today, yeah, bonds are actually doing a pretty good job. So I might not be as strong on this strategy. But do you think a 70 year old would like this down here? That looks pretty good, doesn't it? If you can tell a 70 year old the most you can lose is X percent. That's great, 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 great comfort. They have to give up on the upside, but they're giving up relative to the stocks, not relative to 60 percent in bonds. Now, how did I create this thing? That is what I do when I see the VIX fall below 10. I overinsure. I buy more insurance than I need. Why? Because when the VIX is low, y'all know the VIX, I assume. Anybody can explain the VIX. So we're all volatility and precisely what volatility is it? Is it past volatility or expected future volatility? Yeah, it's future expected volatility. So the VIX is the volatility implied in option prices. And it's a three month volatility. So essentially the VIX at 1324, the stock market or the option market is telling you they think the standard deviation of the US stock market, the S&P 500 is gonna be 13% going forward. Historically, it's been 17%, 18%. So that's a really low VIX. I know it looks like it jumped here recently, but that's one day. It's not all that particularly high right now. What is that right there in my guess? Yeah, that's that's COVID. So five years ago, and you do the max, you'll see 2008 if they go back that far. Yeah, here's 2008. So yeah, it's it jumps up to 80, 90%. It's highly correlated. If you were to graph the VIX against the last 90 days of volatility, it's pretty highly correlated to that. It really reflects recent volatility. It might be heavy like um, last, last Wednesday. It might be a little higher what happened last Wednesday. Oh, that was the Fed meeting. Yeah, the Fed meeting. Why would it be higher where any uncertainty is going to raise the VIX? It might actually fall uh, next Friday, after next Friday. It might be high next Thursday. It might fall next Friday. Why is that? What's the first Friday next week? Yeah, jobs report. So why it might be high on Thursday. Why? Because that's an uncertainty. And then once it's released, it might come down because now you have new information. So it doesn't always track history because it knows something big is happening tomorrow, especially for individual stocks. Right before earnings release, it's going to be really elevated because people are uncertain about the earnings release. But generally, it tracks the recent. So if you, you can graph, it's not hard to do. You can graph the actual volatility S&P against the VIX. So you do the last 90 days versus the VIX, which is the next 90 days. You'll, you'll notice most of the time the lines are right on top of each other. So right now we're at 13%. But let's see if we can bring this in. So the minimum number was 9 that's a really low VIX. When the VIX is low, option prices are really low. I mean, it's quite material. A difference between an 18 VIX and a nine VIX is huge for option pricing. So to me, a VIX at nine is as if you called your, your homeowners and said, I want to insure their, your, my house and say, hey, we have a two for one. If your house burns down, we'll build you two houses for the same premium. That's essentially what the VIX at nine is doing. And when the VIX is as at nine, I think risk is elevated because when the VIX is in, at nine, the stock market is telling you they're not worried about risk. When am I most worried about risk? Well, no one's worried about risk. So to me, it's almost like I call my homeowner's insurance company because there's a fire outside my house and they tell me, hey, we're going to sell the homeowner's insurance. We'll build you two houses. I'm like, OK, I have a fire. Uh, we're not paying attention to that. Like, OK, great. So, I mean, that's that's pretty good. The Investment Society did that right before the Tokyo earthquake because the VIX was so low. Stock market fell 11, our portfolio went up 11%. Why? Because we bought extra insurance because it was so cheap. 
So anytime I see the VIX below 10, I'm like, okay, I'm probably going to be doing some, some hedging strategies and overhedging, hoping that the market crashes because I bought really, really cheap insurance. But you can look at the VIX over time. Uh, you know, you look in a year like 2008, As you go to September when, when Lehman went under. You can, you can see it really rising, getting up into the 70s, up into the 80s. It's really, really rising. I guess I should do equal max. 82. So it got up into the 80s. I heard that it gotten up even higher than that. These highs for the days don't quite show that. You would think it could never get above 100% because you can't lose more than 100%. But it is an annualized number for three months. So it's possible to annualize numbers over 100%, even though the three month is not. But 82, what happens if you see the VIX at 82? Are you going to be buying insurance? Probably not. That's when they say, hey, we'll insure one room of your house for $20,000. You know, it's like really, really expensive insurance. This is when it's too late. I'm going to try and get USAA into options in 1999. And the CEO says, well, that makes sense. We'll do it when it when the time comes. I was like, yeah, but it's cheap right now. We should do it right now. And he said, no, we'll wait. But what's wrong with waiting? Once you know the risk is out there, the insurance premium is going up. Option premium is too late. You've got to act when no one thinks it makes sense to act. So it's a cool, cool ratio. I actually met the lady who developed this ratio. She was on the board at USAA at, on the mutual fund. A professor from Rice. It was like real exciting to meet with her. Just uh, She gave me all kinds of stuff that I couldn't take with me because it was on my computer at USAA. But really, really cool stuff. Really, really smart person. Um, asked really good questions in the committee. Uh, she kind of took over that committee after a while because I think everybody could tell she knew more what was going on than, than anybody else was because she was a pure finance person. Um, so there are times when the VIX falls below 10, I'll set up a strategy so that if the market falls, I'll actually make money. I don't do that very often, but the VIX below 10. So where are we today? If you go back year to date, you got down to 12. So we haven't gotten below 10 uh, this year, but we've gotten some pretty low numbers. Options are fairly inexpensive right now, so it's, it's not a horrible time to trade. Um, now, if you're selling options, it's a terrible time to be selling options because you don't get much premium. You're not getting paid much for the risk. So this is a good time to be buying options. When the VIX is at 80, yeah, you could be selling options, but boy, you it's really scary time to be selling options. Um, so anyway, this is the strategy I think makes sense for your grandparents. The only downside is that there's going to be a few places where they'll lose more money than having the bonds. It's not much, but it's certain places where they may be down 4% instead of 3% or something like that. So, you know, this is kind of, you can kind of see it in there, right? A few places right in here. Um, I'm assuming the bonds make four or five percent no matter what. So it's possible bonds could be up when the stock market's down. That happened in 08, depending on which bonds. Remember what we talked about earlier. If you're talking treasuries, yes. If you're talking about corporates, maybe not. So it kind of depends. Uh, the last year, it's interesting that treasuries are down and corporates are up. So even with right interest rates rising, corporate spreads have come in enough that corporates have done well. So that's that's a strategy. Let me show you a um, a protected put strategy. So let me show you this. This is puts only. So if you do puts only, you're only buying insurance. It's the most expensive way to do this strategy. I don't recommend it, but just to show you a basic basic strategy looks pretty decent. So let me explain this to you. So I took the stock market back the last I don't know how many years. I hate to go back up again. The last forty years, thirty years, whatever that is. I think of, you know, I hear someone talking about the 1980s. I go, oh, yeah, I mean, like 20 years ago. And I was like, no, that wasn't 20 years ago. So anyway. All right. So here's the stock market. The average return is 11 percent. Their best year was 37 percent. 2008, their worst year. Here's bonds. Pretty boring return. 4.8 percent. 
they did as well as 18 percent as bad as 12 that might have been uh yeah that was 2022 i mean look at 2022 and the treasury you're down 20 percent, but this is mainly corporate bonds so here's a 60 a, a 40 60 portfolio would have made 7.6 percent best year 26 worst year minus 14 percent Here's the standard deviations, 18%, 5.5%, but your portfolio. So my question is, is there a better strategy than 40, 60? Can we do something better? And so what I did over here is this is 100% stocks with puts. Why do you notice about the average return? It does a lot better than the stocks and bonds. That's pretty amazingly better, right? That's a pretty noticeable 200 basis points. I said pretty noticeable. The best year, much better. What about the worst year? Not much different. And how much worse could it be? How much did it go down? Well, I went too far, right? I took the stock market completely under. That's down 46%. How did this portfolio do? Y'all notice how much it changed? How much did it change? It was, if the stock market really, really had crashed, watch that 1362. See, y'all let me know how much it falls. Did it fall much? What's the most you can lose with that strategy? Is that comforting to a 70 year old? The most you can lose is 13.6%. You can't lose any more. That's a pretty, can you say that with this strategy? You can't. You have no earthly idea what that strategy might be. In fact, the worst case was actually worse than that. Now, the problem with this is the standard deviation is much higher. But we care about standard deviation on that portfolio. No, because the tail's cut off. Standard deviation assumes a normal curve, but if you cut off the tail, you don't have a normal curve. Standard deviation is not the right measure of risk, but it looks a lot riskier. It looks volatile, but the volatility is stopped at 13%, which is kind of comforting. It's actually, to me, it's less risky than this. Higher return, but worst case is better. Depends on how you define risk. You define risk as volatility, then yeah, it's more risky. I define risk as how much money can I lose? You know, worst case. I don't think of it as standard deviation. I think of it as how bad. Now, I assure you, in 2008, people aren't thinking standard deviation. So we've talked about 2008. So Bear Stern goes under. They're saying, okay, that's kind of bad, but everything goes all right. Then Lehman goes under. Okay, that's really bad. And have we talked about that weekend with Lehman? We did a little bit, right? Just horrible weekend. If, if Barclay is not bail out Merrill Lynch, it's going to be horrible. People aren't thinking standard deviation. What are they thinking? The world's about to come to an end. Right. They're thinking about 100 percent loss. They're thinking about disaster that is just off the charts. I think that's that's how I think about risk. It's not, oh, I'm down 20. I could be down 20. I'm going to say, no, I could be down 90. Something unusual would happen. So you think about Japan, which is the perfect example. Japan fell 85 percent and was down 85 percent. And it just hit a new record high last week. How long did it take? To get back to what it lost from 1989 to 34 years. What if that happened in the United States? Our stock market fell 85% and just barely got to back to where it was 34 years later. How would your grandparents' retirement look? Pretty, pretty horrible. <laughs> so why do we not think that way? Because it's never happened like that in the U.S. Well, the U.S. is like the perfect, it's been the perfect place to be. Um, but will it always be? Who knows? Who knows what's going to happen next? I, I wonder what happens when China attacks Taiwan. That's going to be interesting uh, with semiconductors and everything else. But just the, the people cost is going to be horrible. What is it? How's the U.S. going to reply to that? Do you might know if Biden's there, if Trump's there, who knows what happens in the future? What is President Xi thinking? If Biden gets reelected, I'm going to attack. If Trump gets elected, I'm going to attack. What is he thinking? Who knows? What's Kim going to do? You know, these are, I don't have to worry about it because I'm not managing money anymore. This is all for you to worry about. What are you, what's your portfolio going to do when you, isn't that a pretty big risk? Right? People say AI is going to destroy the world. I'll be in Costa Rica in the jungles 
AI is not going to affect us, but all of you are going to be destroyed. <laughs> um, those are the kind of things people are worried about. I'm not real sure what they think AI is going to destroy the world, other than we just lose control of whatever the computers are doing. We, they're, you know, it's kind of scary. I was reading Henry, Henry Kissinger's book on warfare. It's really not. A, did y'all read that book? I mean, he wrote it when he's 100 and something years old. But uh, so that's pretty impressive. I don't know if he wrote it. He probably just stuck his name on it. And the other two guys wrote it. But uh, it's, I, I didn't think it was a very exciting book, except for the chapter on warfare. Um, so we don't have any soldiers. Our autonomous planes are attacking their autonomous planes and sending missiles. And they're all learning from each other and changing strategy. That's pretty scary, isn't it? That warfare is going to be no humans. That's kind of nice. Someone dies. Our, our robots are killing their robots. And I guess at the end, they send an email and say, hey, we won. Just letting you know. Are you lost? Pack it up. I don't know what's going to happen. Warfare is actually more information warfare now, like propaganda. Yeah, cyber yeah it's, it's going to be it's gonna be interesting for, for your lives. It just means something in the next 40 years, pretty, pretty major is going to happen, which means standard deviation, all this stuff really doesn't matter. And those extremes, we've never seen it before. Who knows what's going to happen? Standard deviation won't tell you that. Now, it's true. The option market might blow up as well. So, you know, now one problem with this strategy, and we're going to talk about this with Caleb, is what really drives this strategy? Well, really just one year. The strategy looks really good because of one year. And what is that one year? 2008. 2008 helps you dramatically. Um, so you need, you need a 2008 kind of event for these put options. If you never have another really bad market, it's just gonna cost you a lot of money and you're gonna have a lot of years where you're gonna perform. But I, I like this strategy, like this year, this last year, you would have done a lot better with this strategy because stock market was up. The put options on, didn't cost you all that much because the VIX was pretty low, it was a pretty inexpensive strategy. Um, so yeah, I, I, I like this strategy for a 70 year old. So much that I created a mutual fund to do it and then our lawyers wouldn't let us sell it to anybody. Because this is for very conservative, safety-free kind of 70-year-olds. And they said, the lawyer says, we can't sell it to them because they have to be sophisticated investors. And I'm saying, this is for unsophisticated investors. And they say, no, you can't have an option strategy for us. So it's just really bizarre. Um, that we, so we couldn't sell it to anybody. It just didn't, we couldn't structure it correctly. I would love to do something like this. The other thing was my boss wanted to charge 1% management fee. And it was like, you know, this takes us like 10 minutes a week to do this. We don't need to charge water basis points. But he was thinking about making money. I was like, no, you don't need to charge that much. This is a really, really good strategy. But you just can't. The mutual fund world won't do this. Maybe maybe the ETF world could. Who knows? Um, I wish one of y'all would start a firm to do this type of strategy because it's really, really missing out there. Um, the industry wants to charge way too much for the strategy, which really kills it. You don't need to charge much because these are not difficult strategies to manage. They're, you can somewhat put them on, on autopilot. You, you have to watch every once in a while when markets are moving, but you don't, you don't, it's not the same as trying to beat the stock market by analyzing individual stocks, that kind of thing. It's just not that complex. So I'm not saying go do this strategy. I think there are better strategies than this. But this is pretty basic, pretty straightforward strategy that, that you could implement and would, would work pretty, pretty well. Any questions on options? So not not to brag, I you know, I'm gonna tell you all the good stuff I did at USA, the really bad stuff. You know, I somehow I forgot those, so I can't really tell you about those. But uh so just give you my scenario. So Bob Davis retires. Um any of y'all saw Tim Handren last year, you can kind of know. He was talking about a very strange period of time. So Joe Robles takes over. Bob Davis hated stocks. He had us out of the stock market. We were essentially all in cash, which was a terrible investment strategy. So I'm head of equities. Bob Davis goes. We get a new CEO, Joe, Joe Robles, who I'm really like to work with him a lot. Um, nice thing with him is he trusted you as long as you didn't mess up. And I had a really good reputation. So he let me do whatever I wanted to do. But he's a brand new CEO starting in 2008. And I'm head of equity, and what I do, I get us back into stocks. But then I start thinking, we, we get into stocks after Bear Stearns, the market's up 9%, we got 9% gain. I start getting nervous. 
because I want to do options. The option broker's not set up. So I get out of stocks, market falls, I get us back in, we got the options. Um, I'm thinking a couple of things. You might think you don't think this way in finance, but I'm thinking a couple of things. A brand new CEO in a year, everybody's talking about subprime and I get him back in the stocks. I could really kill his reputation. The stock market crashes and he's like, hey, I got us back in the stocks. So I'm not just protecting USA's risk. I'm also thinking about the morale of all the employee base of a CEO that gets us back in the stock. And so how did we do? So I'm very proud of this, my whole department. So y'all know who this is? Joe Robles, yeah, he's probably still, he's like a saint at USA. He's like people, he was a really good, really good guy. Um, so um, he had my portfolio on his his letter to the members and the annual report. So here's my portfolio right here. Say, why well, am I proud of a 1% return? That's pretty <laughs> pathetic, isn't it? Why well, am I proud of a 1% return? Because here's my benchmark. So we made 1% in 2008 and the market was down 37%. How do you do that? You do it with options. Now, specifically, I can't lie to you, but specifically, we got back in the stocks. We had the options. So the market was down 50%. We were down like 9%. So we did lose money. And then in November, our options expired. We had all this money. I went to Joe and said, we want to take all the options off. And we just want to ride the market. My boss was just freaking out. We can't do that. We go to Joe. Joe says, well, if you invest in stocks, you're going to lose money sometimes. So he was like, pretty cool, right? Because it's a horrible year. Pretty cool. So, okay, good, Joe. So we took all the options off. The market rallied in the, we had a Santa rally. It rallied 9% through December 30th. And then it rallied 1% on December 31st. So we had, a, my boss was like, we better have a positive return. I was like, are you kidding me? You were wanting me to have a positive return in 2008, but we did. We ended up with a positive return. A lot of it was pure luck, but we had a big debate in November because of what I just told you, because we were doing spreads, which means we were selling options. Um, and one of the guys was like, man, the VIX is so high, we should keep selling the options. And we were buying options and selling options. And I was like, no, I just want to go go into the stock market. So we did that, worked real. But they, we put the options back on in January, and then the market crashed. We took them off. So we were, it's luck. Some of it's luck, but it was pretty cool luck that we were, it was working out. But this is this is pretty good. Um, so he even talks about it in here somewhere. Um, in fact, USA's PNC equity portfolio, that's that's my portfolio, returned a positive 1% last year, dramatically different than most equity portfolios. Um, so USA did have huge investment losses because interest rates, because of their corporates, were just crashing. So they were down billions on the corporate side, but at least I didn't add another, you know, several hundred million dollars in losses there. Um, so it can work. Options can be really powerful. You really got to think about your strategy, what you want to do. And then you got to go through scenarios when they don't work. So you make sure your management realizes, hey, if this happens, you're going to see this. So they have an understanding of what's what's going on. But uh, yeah, that was that was a good result for us. Um, do you all know how to how to purchase options? So you got to be careful, right? So how do you test it? What's the best way to get into options? Paper portfolio or actual real life portfolio? Paper portfolio. Start with a paper portfolio. If you could do a paper portfolio with Charles Schwab or Ameritech or whoever, Ameritrade, excuse me, Ameritrade, um, it looks pretty real life. It feels like you're actually trading. The, the prices are there. You can test out different strategies. How many strategies are there? Oh, I can't even remember the names of all of them. Condors and everything else. Yeah, that's not going to tell me. Oh, the CBOE is a great site to go to, though. CBOE.com, that's the Chicago Board of Option Exchange. They have really good training material on their sites. They have the entire option chain, which you don't really need now. You can get that other places, but really, really good stuff. So the CBOE is a really, really good place to go. They have tutorials that help you understand uh, all kinds of stuff. It's a really, really excellent site. Um, but there's plenty... There's plenty of, uh, here's one that says that you should know. Covered calls, we talked about that in my investment class, that we did a lot of covered calls. We were doing actually covered calls with a put spread. Um, I'm, 
yeah, she probably tell you my worst, my most stressful day at USAA was related to that, but covered calls. So that's what a covered call looks like, but ours was a covered call with a put spread. Um, there's the put strategy, a, a, a spread strategy. So spreads just mean you're buying, a call, buying an option and selling an option. So I actually think a spread, if you're going to sort a stock, you should buy the call-ups and borrow the money just in case that stock takes off. So there's ways you can cover your losses, um, but you can just see the different strategies, straddles, strangles, um, butterflies. And we have an alum who's, this is his career. So Eric Moss up in Chicago, he's trading options. Um, he spoke at UTSA a couple of semesters ago. I had lunch with him uh, about a year and a half ago. He's doing great. He's about to get married, so he may get out of business entirely, which is kind of strange. But anyway, uh, you can make this your entire career. Um, I think we should be doing this more often. I think there's some opportunities there that um, the industry doesn't like doing because they haven't figured out how to make money off of it. So they're more focused on um, sales and career risk than they are on their customers' risk. But I do think there's some strategies there. And there's several books out there comparing exactly what I'm doing here. What if you do this option strategy versus just buying stocks and bonds? What's the, what's the give and take? So there's no strategy that's going to win every single time with options. But there are strategies that win at just the right times and are mediocre. And my strategy, just to give you my strategy, some of you have heard it before. I like, you smile, you might know this one. It sounds really, really uh, kind of evil. But this is my strategy. I like to smile when everyone's laughing. I like to laugh when everyone's crying. Um, that's about as evil as you can get. But what am I saying? If the market's up 20%, I'm fine being up 18. If the market's down 40%, I want to be up 10. <laughs> All right. So that's just the thing. Like 2008, the market was down 35%. My own portfolio is up 16. I'm laughing, right? Because I'm retiring in 09. So I'm pretty happy. Um, but when everybody's up 20, you're only up 18. Yes, well, big deal. And they're saying, well, how can you be so stupid? It's like, well, just wait. My time's coming. My time comes, what, every five or so years. So you have four years where you're mediocre, and you have one year where if you're up 16 when the market's down 35, that makes up for a lot of those pre previous years. So that's my strategy. This is also, that's also Taleb's strategy. So we'll talk about Taleb later. This is idea of having something that benefits from volatility in your portfolio. Most people don't do that. And industry doesn't do that. Why? Because the industry hates four years of mediocrity. Remember, they're focused on career risk. They can't set up that one big year because they gotta, they've got to play the game those other four years. So it's a really tough strategy, but I, I like it. I don't think you should have a t-shirt that says that. Um, what would people think if you had that on a t-shirt? <laughs> probably be avoiding you or something, but um, I think you're gonna hit them. So you, you, they start crying. Uh, all right, any questions on market risk? It's probably one of the biggest things uh, you're going to have to deal with. All right, no questions. Let's talk credit risk. But before I do that, though, I did put a new file out there on our, our page on Canvas. I, I put an outline for the risk project. It's, it's somewhat the rubric for the project. So if you want to know what should be in there, I wish I could show you a previous paper, but all of my previous papers are on Blackboard. And Blackboard still exists for previous classes, but not previous paper submissions. So I don't know if I have one I can show you, but I'll try to find one maybe I can show you. I made a mistake of putting example one out on one class and which means I ended up reading that paper like 60 times. <laughs> Every student just copied it and it's like, no, I'm not going to do that. So, but I'll, I'll give you some ideas. But if you look at it, it gives you a, a good description of what, what I want. You really just need to follow that. So if you have any questions reading through that, it's not, it's not that lengthy. It's really not that difficult of a paper. Y'all are all freaked out because of paper one, but it's not, it's not <laughs> nearly as difficult. Most students don't have that much trouble with this. And remember, if you have any trouble with the Excel, 
stop email it to me and I'll, I'll fix it and send it back so you don't waste time on it. So, but that's out there as the very last file on their files for, for papers. All right, let's talk credit risk. <clears throat> so credit risk is a major, major, major risk. Um, you saw in your banks, that was really the bulk of the risk management section. For most banks, that was like 10, 20 pages long. It's just amazing. So what we have to realize, though, is that credit risk has been redefined after 2008. And so there's, and you might not have noticed it in your banks. So there's two ways to define it. One is a very pure definition, which is default risk. It's the risk that someone owes you money and doesn't pay you. Right, that'd be the most pure definition. But now the definition is your bond price falls because of the fear of credit risk, even if it never defaults. And that's what we call spread risk. That's the risk that the bond price falls, even though you still think you're going to get your money back. Right. So talk about default risk versus spread risk. Some of your bank's credit risk is only the default risk, and they put spread risk on their market risk. Some banks, default risk and spread of risk was on their credit risk. It just depends on the bank. I've seen it both ways. I kind of think of spread risk more as a market risk than a, I think a credit risk is an actual default. What's the risk this person's not gonna pay me back? Um, but it depends on the bank. So in 2008, we saw bonds I mean, literally dropping 50, 60, 70%, even though the person owning the bond was very confident they were gonna get all their money back. And they're just going like, what's going on? It's a crazy, crazy market. Bond prices are just falling, just to fall. It's just very, very scary. So someone owes you money and they don't pay according to the contract. All right, so be real careful. It doesn't mean you don't get the money you're expecting because mortgage-backed securities, if interest rates rise or fall, you may get a very different payment because they may refinance their debt. That's not the fault risk because it's in the contract, they're doing what the contract allows. The fault risk is they were supposed to make a payment on Friday and they didn't make it, and that's a default. Um, some people are better at it than others. So how many, how many Argentina defaults? How many times does anybody know the answer to that? Is it more than one? Yes. Nine times. So that's, they're the champs. They got it. <laughs> they, got, they win first place. Um, why would you keep loaning them money? Would you loan your friend money if they haven't paid you nine, eight times? So they have a new president, right? Pretty weird guy, but interesting guy. Um, so far, the market has seemed to have kind of liked, liked him so far, right? I don't know if there's USA talking about this guy. I mean, it's, it's the, wasn't his strategy to change the to make the power. Yeah. I mean, there's some things technically he, he may have, but he's. Yeah, so far, the economist actually had a pretty decent article on him. They're kind of like, um, we're expecting something really wild and crazy, but so far he's been okay. So um, it's kind of the same thing with the, the head of Italy as well. It's like, so far, she's been really pretty decent that people like and they're like worrying about the you know people think the extreme which i guess is good but will they default again you know nine times uh, i don't know how many years that is but um argentina used to be one of the richest countries in the world and what went wrong if you read that book that i really highly recommend why nations fell they talk a lot about argentina there why didn't argentina work out when the u.s did because they were in they were probably in better shape than the U.S. some of those years, and yet it all fell apart. Why? What's the key to that? Um, so in 2008, this issue became an issue for the Federal Reserve because we've talked about liquidity risk. When you have liquidity risk, the problem is they're not really default. They're not bankrupt. But they, if they don't get cash, they will be bankrupt. So it's just a liquid. They just need some cash. So it's like your neighbor is like, okay, I get paid next Thursday, but I got to pay this bill today and they cut the electricity off. You're like, okay, fine. You just need cash. You're not bankrupt. What do you find out next Friday? Yeah. Like, oh, I didn't get paid today. Sorry, something happened. Yeah, and then you discover it wasn't liquidity risk. What was it? Well, it was a default risk. So think about the Fed in 2008. They had to decide, is this a liquidity crisis or a credit crisis? 
it's a liquidity crisis, what do they do? They provide cash. If it's a credit crisis and so they provide cash, what do they do? They just create a much more massive disaster three months later. And, and what do you want to be a Fed chairman? You got to make that decision. Do we provide cash, make sure AIG doesn't go under, or do we just let them go under? We, do we bail Lehman Brothers out, or we just let them go under? Do we try to get Merrill Lynch purchase and let them go under? If it's a liquidity crisis and you let them go under, the liquidity crisis causes a true crisis. And then you did a horrible job. Japan had banks that were really, really under. They should have been, they should have let them fail and they kept bailing them out. And what happened? They just have this dead bunch of banks. That's just a disaster for the economy. If they let them go under, they would have fixed it. Everything would have washed through. They could have started fresh. Instead, they kept propping them up. So this is a big issue. Is it a liquidity crisis or is it a credit crisis? And if you don't get that right as a Fed chairman, you, you, you either cause a much bigger crisis or you delay a much bigger crisis to later to make it even bigger. So it's it's tough. Um, most people think Paulson did a pretty good job in 08. I'm not an economist, but I'll just say that. Um, but that tends to be the discussion most people have. I don't know if any of y'all, um, oh, what's his name? Vol Volker. So the Fed chairman in 1980, he wrote a book. Have you ever read his book, any of y'all? It's an interesting, interesting book. So uh, it has some chapters a little weird at the end, but it's an interesting book. He passed away, but he wrote a book right before. Um, interesting. Volker, I don't, I don't know how to spell his name. Is that close? Not Bonk. Oh, man, that's, I don't know what Bonk is. So Paul Volker, when did he pass away? It was pretty recently here. Um, the Triumph of Persistence. I thought it was a pretty interesting. I don't have it on my reading list because I didn't. It wasn't like didn't blow me away, but it was it was kind of a historical kind of interest kind of book. It was just kind of interesting to hear him talk. Obviously, he's highly, highly, highly respected. Um, let's see when he passed away. I can't remember. Yeah, three, four years ago. So, so he's the one that had to bring inflation down from the 80s, caused two recessions in two years. That's how bad inflation it was. Um, so interesting, interesting Fed chairman, smart guy. Um, he has some, he has some pretty cool things to say, um, just practical living kind of things. But um, yeah, so the Federal Reserve has a lot of power in these prices because they do have to decide how much to jump in and try to save things. Uh, I don't think he talked about Paulson in his book, but you could probably find a book talking about Paulson. There were several books that came out of the 2008 crisis. I read three or four of them. It's They're pretty shocking stories, no question. Um, so how do you measure it? So there's a definition. It can either be the fault risk only, or it can be the fault risk and spread risk, depending on how you define it. How do you measure it? The number one way we measure it is credit ratings. There's a high correlation between credit ratings and the probability of the fault. Our agencies do a pretty good job of rating corporate debt and the probability of default if you look historically at their numbers. So what are the credit ratings? So Standard & Poor's and Moody's, those are the two big guys. There's a really good um, podcast from um, Business Breakdowns. It's a podcast I highly recommend. They did Moody's and that one is a very fascinating discussion. Um, Moody's is a publicly traded company. I don't know if realize that. And they do a whole lot more than credit ratings. They sell a lot of software. The business breakdown had a really good idea, you know, really good overview of where all they make their money uh, and their history. Why are Moody's and S&P the two big players? And coming out of 2008, the government tried to change that. They tried to bring in more competition, more credit ratings. But Moody's has a, you know what an economic moat is? I heard that term. So Moody's has this economic moat that really protects them from competition. Why? Because Moody's and S&P are so embedded in what we do on the on the bond side that it would be really tough to change that whole process. As much as the government tried to change it, they just couldn't. I mean, there's others out there, but Moody's and S&P are the two primary ones. Um, and how do they rate? So it's really key that it's not just the capacity to pay their debt. 
So that's the likelihood of the fault. But look at this right here. It's, this is related to U.S. government. It's the capacity and, you'll see that word, willingness. Why did S&P downgrade the U.S. government? Because they started saying, hey, we may not pay. We can pay our debt back. We may not pay back because we're hitting that, that ceiling. So it's capacity and willingness. You may have the money to pay your debt back, but you say, hey, you know what? Let them, let them, they can, they can go under. Um, so you got to pay on time. So what happens if the U.S. hits the debt ceiling and Congress doesn't fix it? How, how long can um, the Treasury Secretary last? Has she said yet? She usually comes out and says, I can make it to whatever I haven't seen recent. Um, but that's what what's going to happen if they don't make the payments. My guess is they'll do like IOUs. So if you have treasury debt, the government will give you money, but a bank will probably give you 99 cents on the dollar or something. You know, they'll, people take it as collateral. You probably can get cash somehow. But do we want to experience that or not? I, I don't want to hear that. Do you think the Republican Party wants to do that in an election year? So what are they thinking? Uh, it'd be horrible for the National Party, but I win my seat for my, you know, which, which are they going to decide? The best interests of the National Party or their particular district? How do politicians think? How selfish are they? So we'll see what happens with this. There's some pretty loud voices. Um, and when you saw the Republicans trying to get their leader of the House, right? It's an incredible balance. A battle. Both of these parties are just fighting each other uh, within themselves. So it creates incredible risk. So that's why willingness to pay is so important because of these political battles that are going on in the United States. And then the nature and provisions of the obligation, what collateral you have, those type of things. Um, so and then what happens after they go bankrupt? Where are you in line? What are the rules? This might be more important to other countries as well. Uh, what can they actually do? Um, so SMP is all cap letters and all the same letter. And most others, I think all the others are like that. So SMP is the normal. So if you're looking at Fitch and some of the others, yeah, it's all capital letters. Triple A, how many triple A's are left on the corporate side? I think it's two. Was Exxon, but I think why did I say how many AAA companies left in Afghanistan? Why did it say that? Yeah. Are there AAA companies in Afghanistan? Uh, so it was um, Johnson and Johnson and one other, but I can't. Uh, maybe Microsoft. So it's Exxon was up there for a while, but. Johnson, Johnson, Marcus. I don't know what Exxon is now, but not many. There was a lot when I was started my career. There was a lot of AAA companies. State Farm was AAA. USAA was AAA. San Antonio was AAA. Um, a lot of U.S. government was AAA. So a lot of firms. In fact, San Antonio was AAA after after U.S. got downgraded. They used to brag, hey, the city of San Antonio is safer than the U.S. government. Uh, I don't think that was quite right. I mean, think about it. When the U.S. government's debt was downgraded, what did U.S. Treasury yields do? Did they rise or fall? If you downgrade a corporate bond, what did their, their yields do? They can go up. What did U.S. government yields do when they, they downgrade? Went they went down. What? Right? So something bizarre is going on. So there's not many, many triple A's left. There's a few double A's. Double A's a really good rating. The difference between probability bankruptcy between a triple A and double A is almost indistinguishable. You're talking about like 0.8% over 10 years versus 0.9% over 10 years. I mean, it's just almost indistinguishable. So they say your your probability of paying back is extremely strong, very strong, and strong. So these, I, I classify any A-rated, AA, single A, triple A as high quality. The probability he's going to default is really, really low. Now, there are some exceptions. If I remember correctly, Enron, you have heard of Enron? Houston Company went bankrupt in 2002, I think. I believe they were double A the year they went bankrupt. They weren't double A when they went bankrupt. So S&P and Moody's to say, 
no no triple A or double A firm has ever gone bankrupt. That's because they downgraded them right before they went bankrupt. So that doesn't really count. So the me is what were they six months before? And I believe Enron was a double A rated, maybe single A, but it was a highly rated firm. Triple B, now they're starting to use words you hope your parents don't use about you. They're adequate. It's like, yeah, it's, it's good enough, but adequate. Their capacity to pay interest and principal, either one of those is a default. If you miss an interest payment, that's the fault as well. It doesn't have to just be principal. So their capacity is adequate. There's a huge difference in the probability of the fault between a single A. You see a big jump, like going from 1% probability to a 5% probability, much more likely chance. Um, and then they have a whole lot, notice how much longer the paragraphs are. They say it's adequate. However, if the economy really blows up or you have some kind of crisis, those kind of thing, you know, there's an event that could really, really derail them versus the AAA is going to be able to survive anything. And Microsoft, you know, how could Microsoft not pay its bills? You look at their balance sheet. They have they have over a hundred billion dollars in cash, which is greater than their debt. So if you have a four hundred thousand dollar mortgage and you have eight hundred thousand sitting in the cash in your checking account, is your bank worried? Well, they may be wondering what you're going to do with the eight hundred thousand dollars in cash. But as far as today, you can probably pay your debt. You can just write a check for it. And that's essentially where Microsoft is, is they, you know, they have more cash than they have in debt. So you might ask the question, why are they even borrowing money? How many people do you know have $800,000 in cash from going out and borrowing $400,000? Probably related to the taxes, right? Anytime you see that, it's using the IRS that's driving that there's some tax reason going on. Um, but Triple B, if things go wrong, yeah, they're going to start having struggles. They're going to have to start having trouble. But that's still investment grade. So these are fairly decent bonds. They're probably the fault. It's much higher than single A, but it's like five percent over ten years. So it's not it's not massive. Huh? Yeah, so like it's been a year now. They've been putting more on their cash. Uh, what's it called? They've been paying them for right. I've seen a few companies like that. If you look at their interest expenses, it's actually a negative number. So yeah, there's a few companies like that, especially when now that short term rates are so high. Um, but. So triple B, don't look at a triple B and say, well, it's a really weak company. There are a lot of triple B firms that are just perfectly fine firms. Their, their probability default is really quite low. Then you get into speculative. So double B, now they use a word I can't even pronounce, vulnerability. You're starting to see that word. Double B are fine firms as well. Netflix was double B for the longest time. So double B is not, not bad, but if we have a recession, you'd have to watch them very carefully. Something could blow them. Why was Netflix so lowly ready? Because they're borrowing so much money. They were spending so much money on new production. Um, the market just got, it was really strike. I was talking to my bond bond friends and said, okay, the stock market loves Netflix and you guys hate them. Why is it? I said, look at their cash flow statement. My word, they, they, they're spending cash. It's just so wild. The stock market likes it because it's going to create a lot of growth. And if things blow up, you know, the stockholders say, well, they'll just walk away. But the bondholders are like, man, who's going to pay for all of this? So they're worried. Does Netflix not work out? That's a lot of debt. So those are dangerous. I was interested because we have a group going to Costa Rica. Anybody want to guess Costa Rica credit rating? You might be surprised. B2, but stable. So they're solidly B2. What is B2? That's a pretty weak, that's a pretty weak bond, right? What's Argentina? How low can you go? Triple C. Triple C is not, I mean, you can be double C and single C, so they got two more notches to go, <laughs> but pretty, pretty weak. Uh, Puerto Rico. They've, they've been recovering some. Wow, it's not even in there. So they've been they've been coming back. Uh, they're trying to cut their budgets and all those kind of things. But yeah, I mean, this is a, a, this is a, a state or a territory that 
obviously Hurricane Maria just they had Hurricane Maria and then a few days later they had Hurricane Trump and it just destroyed their debt. Maria destroyed the con the country, the host island, and then Trump came in and said, Hey, we're not gonna bail you off, and that destroyed them a second. You can watch the bond price. It went like this with Maria, it went like that with, with Trump. So some people say the worst possible thing at the worst possible time. Uh, but yeah, that's that's a place that's really, really struggling. Would you buy their bonds? It's the fault. Well, if you buy 10 cents on the dollar and you restructure and pay 20 cents, what have you just done? You just made 100%. So yeah, I mean, you can buy those bonds. There are people who buy distressed debt, distressed company debt. Uh, it may seem crazy, but you know, they're looking at, I don't need it. I don't need you to pay 100%. I just need you to pay something because I'm paying almost nothing. Um, I don't know. Um, I don't know how to spell Venezuela. How do you theory you know, Venezuela? Do they even have a credit rating? C. So what's the next level below C? D, right? It's triple C, double C, single C. What does D mean? Well, you've defaulted. So that's the easiest one to remember. D for default. Um, would you loan money to, to Venezuela? It's kind of interesting now, right? A new president, pretty radical. You pay 10 cents on the dollar, you lose your 10 cents, but you could make 300%, 400%. It's kind of interesting if you got the guts to step in and see what he's going to do, because it's it's kind of crazy, kind of interesting. Um, so those are the ratings. You can just see the words. I mean, they just, how do you distinguish between triple? Essentially what they're saying on the C's is, they can make it with a miracle. That's essentially what they're saying. We need something wild and crazy, wonderful to happen to this firm, and they'll make it. Otherwise, they're not going to make it. That's what they're saying with Triple C. So look at this last one, where a bankruptcy petition has been filed, but debt service payments continued. What might happen? Maybe a competitor will buy them out and restructure the debt or something. Who knows? If you restructure the debt, essentially you defaulted, but at least you got bondholders will get something. Um, so. Those are the ratings. Um, let me show you, and this is something you can create yourself. Um, Bloomberg that I highly recommend. I've shown some of y'all this before. Let's see what was the last one I did. I can't remember. Uh, last update, it might've been August, October. I need to update this again. I think I updated it recently, but there's some issue going on between AAA and AA. So in Bloomberg, they have these massive tickers for the OAS. Anybody remember OAS? Option adjusted spread. What is an option adjusted spread? It's usually wrong on Wikipedia. So, oh, it's the Organization of American States. <laughs> But Wikipedia is actually a pretty good place to go, though I diff, 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 well, Investopedia is like the worst <laughs> because they never def, they never never define it. You're kind of it's like, would you just say what it is? Um, what is an option adjusted spread? The option adjusted spread is the measurement of the spread of a fixed income security, which is then adjusted to take into account embedded options. They never tell you what it is. It's adjusted to do something. What does that mean? Anybody remember the definition of OAS? So you have two choices. So you have a bond that has an embedded option. You can prepay your mortgage. You can call the bond. So is the OAS the extra spread you get because you're giving them that option? Or is the OAS the extra spread you get subtracting the option spread? Which would be the credit spread. So the OAS is your credit spread or is OAS the spread you're getting because you're giving them an option? You might remember which is it? As you read Wikipedia and Investopedia, they imply it's the spread you're getting for selling the option. You're giving, but that's not the right one. Now, OES is actually the credit spread. So let's let's look at this. is really, really important to understand. And that's why I don't like this definition, because they don't actually tell you what's, what's going on here. So especially if you're going to interview with Victory Capital or someone like that, you need to know this. So let's say a callable bond. 
has a yield of 7.5% and the risk free rate is 5%. All right, so what's the spread? That's pretty easy. 2.5% or 250 BIPs. Y'all know what a BIP is? 250 basis points, right? 5% plus 2.5%. If it were non-callable, the rate would have been 7%. So how much extra are you getting paid as, uh, as the investor for giving them the right to pay off the debt early? 50 bips. So the option premium is 50 bips. So the OAS is not 50 bips. What is the OAS? It's 200. 200, right. Oh, man, I don't know what I hit. And you're going to see why I don't like Investopedia. So what the OAS is, you got the spread, 250 basis points over risk-free rate. Some of that is a spread that compensates you for giving them the right to pay off the debt early. You want to be compensated for that, right? Because when are they going to pay it off early? When it's in your favor and then or in their favor. In their favor, right? They're always going to act against you. So you better get paid for that. That's 50 basis points. But you're also worried about them defaulting. How much are you getting paid for that? 200 basis points, all right? The OAS is the 200. But when you read Wikipedia and Vestipedia, they make it almost sound like the, the OAS is the 50 basis points, but it's not. Now, what if you have a bond that's non-callable What's the option for you? There isn't any. Treasuries, you can, the US government cannot pay off treasuries early. There is no optionality, so it doesn't have any option for you. All right, if you have a corporate bond that can't be paid off early, the OAS and the spread are the same thing, all right? There is no option premium, all right? So just be real clear. So this is historically, these are the OASs on these bonds. And so if you look at them, this is the ticker. I know it's crazy tickers. L-U-3-A-T-R-U-E-E -E -E space index will bring in AAA OAS. It's only the spread, right? So you have to add this to the risk-free rate, but that's the spread. What's the risk-free rate? But it doesn't matter because they're doing three-year bonds that are compared to three-year treasuries. They're doing five-year bonds compared to five. So it's all of them combined. It's that OAS for them. And here's L-U-2-A. So you can kind of see they do L-U-3-A for AAA instead of L-U-A-A-A -A -A, and A-U-L-U-2-A. I don't know what the L-U stands for. I don't know what the T-R-U-U stands for. I don't know why there's so many U's in there, but that's the index. That's the double A, single A. If you do this in Bloomberg, and here's the formula in Bloomberg. It's a pretty lengthy formula, but if you bring it in, so if you don't have to set up the formula, then I can send you the spreadsheet and you can look at it. And it will automatically, if I brought it in and updated it, it automatically updated to the most current period. I've only went through August here. I know I updated it more recently, but I, I don't know where I, I filed it. So you can bring those in. So AAA, what do you notice about the OAS as we go down in credit quality? Look at the jump between the single A and triple B. And then you have high yield. Pretty big jump, all right? And so what I do at the bottom is I show you the median on AAA is 0.3. What is that? That's actually 30 basis points, 0.3%, 30 basis points. The average for AA is 83, for single A is 121, triple B is 178, high yield is 494. The current as of a few months ago is what? Higher or lower than the average? much quite a bit lower which doesn't make a lot of sense to me because everybody's worried about the u.s going into recession we're worried about what the fed's going to do or we're worried about inflation it doesn't make sense to me that spreads are lower than historical averages when was the worst look at 2008 2008 was the worst corporate bond market in history even worse than the great depression it's horrible look at this triple a paying 157 basis points that looks like a triple B bond. 
In 2008, you could buy triple A bonds. I don't know how many there were back then, two or three or four. It was probably Exxon was probably still triple A back then. They were paying 150 basis points over risk-free rates. A huge, huge, huge spread. Pretty, pretty crazy. And then back in June of 2021, it was 12, you could almost not even tell the difference between loaning the corporation money and loaning the U.S. government money. 12 basis points. Hardly even notice it. Uh, so that's the low period. Look at high yield. High yield back in 2021, you're getting 2.68%. A large percentage of those bonds are going to default, but you're only getting paid 2.68% extra return. I wouldn't buy a high yield bond. Look at, I was buying high yield in 2008. Look at their spread in 2008. 1,800 bips. So the bond guy, the reason I bought high yield in 08 is our high yield bond guy, Matt, he says, I have some bonds that it's impossible for the stockholders to do better than the bondholders. Their bonds are priced better than the stocks. I mean, I'm going to make a higher return buying the bonds than buying the stocks. That shouldn't happen, right? Stocks be riskier. When he said that, I said, you know what? Yeah, the high yield. So I had to do an 09. High yield was up 70%. The stock market was up 70%. So I tied. But if you graph the two of them together, the stock market went up 70% like this. High yield went up 70% like that. So it was like a really fun ride up 70% with very few bumps. Yeah, so high yield. I'm not buying high yield today. Um, 400 basis points. I don't know where it is now, but it's probably not that much different. You're not getting paid much to take credit risk right now. Uh, it's just not much. I've been buying treasuries in some places just because treasury yields look pretty good. They're very liquid. They're easy to buy, and I'm not getting paid much to take the risk. So having this historical context is really good. In fact, if I were you, I would update the spreadsheet, print this out, and carry it with me in my wallet so that you just know. So if you're interviewing with someone at Victory Capital, it would be really nice to know what a typical spread is on a triple B, double B bond. Um, so, and it's really easy to bring in. You just, you just, you have to be on a Bloomberg machine, but you just click Bloomberg, update spreadsheet, and it brings in the latest month. It's a really, really good spreadsheet. Um, you need to have some context of what spreads normally do. One problem I've had, and that may be because there's only two AAA left, is for some reason, the last couple of months, the AAA spread has gone above the AA spread. And it's never happened before in history. So I'm wondering if there may be some data problem. And it might not be that Microsoft and Johnson & Johnson are riskier. It could be that since there's only two, they have a lot of 10-year bonds or something, which have wider spreads than two-year bonds. So it could be when you only have a sample size of two, I don't know if I trust the numbers anymore. So I might start ignoring the AAA and just looking at the AA. But those spreads are really, really important. You'll see why when we look at the notes. So there's other ways to measure credit risk. Altman Z has been real popular. I'm not a big fan of Altman Z. Um, I ran a regression of Altman Z, the credit scores, and there's no correlation whatsoever. Uh, Altman, Altman, if y'all have looked up Altman, if y'all have used Altman in other classes, because it's a really easy number to get. You can get it off of Bloomberg. I think Altman argued the reason there's not a correlation between Altman scores and S&P and Moody's is because Altman is not telling you if a great company is better than a good company, they're just telling you what companies are likely to default. They're only looking at the downside. They're not really grading the upside. So who are the worst ones? Everybody else is kind of all in one category. Bloomberg's probably default is actually pretty good. It's a number, which is nice, right? Because you use credit ratings, that's a letter. It's hard to do regression analysis with letters. But Bloomberg is a number and is highly correlated to credit ratings. So the Bloomberg ratings, the Bloomberg probably the default. They have several of them. They have a one-year probability, a five-year, or maybe a 10-year. Uh, we use those a lot in investment society because it's a really good way to assess quality of a company by using those Bloomberg. The nice thing about Bloomberg is they, they give you a score for every single company. Whereas S&P and Moody's, not everybody, you know, like Lululemon doesn't have a credit score. Why doesn't Lululemon have a credit rating? Because they don't borrow money. If you don't borrow money, you don't need a credit rating. So there's some really important companies that don't have credit ratings, but Lululemon will have a probability of default that you can use. So there are other measures. Um, I, I actually think this is more helpful. If I use 
S&P, Moody's, and Regression, what I have to do is convert the AAA into a number. And so what I do is I'll go back and look what probability is it for a AAA default over a certain number of years, and I use that as my number. Very similar to what uh, uh, Bloomberg is doing. So I mean, there's ways to measure this, but that's the, our most common way of measuring it. Or you just do your own analysis. You do your, like some of your banks say they use internal ratings. So they're doing the same thing S&P and Moody's are doing, but they're assigning their own ratings. When I was at USA, the bond guys said, we have our own internal ratings. And it's like, how different are they from S&P and Moody's? Uh, not too different. <laughs> like if you're an, you're an analyst, and S&P and Moody's rates a, a bond at double B, what do you think your rating is going to be? You think you're going to have a double A rating on that bond? You can go to your boss and say, hey, the market hates this bond. I think it's great. Let's put a lot of money into it. You're probably not going to have the guts to be that different. So you're probably, you might go double B plus, maybe triple B minus if you're really, really gutsy, but you're probably not going to go too far away. All right, so here's the math on the exam. We'll talk about it next class. There's two things we have to worry about. The probability of the fault but if it defaults, what's our recovery? Because you don't always lose 100%. In fact, with AAA bonds, if they default, you'll probably still get half your money back. All right, so those are the two things we're looking for. All right, so we'll start there this next time. All right, we got to definitely get a little caught up here. So we're going to finish up credit risk. Credit risk is fairly straightforward. One of the easiest questions in any of my exams. So if you think about a credit spread, that's how much you get paid annually over... The risk free rate. So it's going to compensate you for default. So what is the fault? It's the it's frequency times severity. It's oh sorry, lo siento. So what is what is your loss if you have a if a bond doesn't pay? You have the probability of the fault. What's the chances that defaults? And then when it defaults, you don't lose one hundred percent. So you lose. 100% minus what your recovery is. Now, I'm ignoring time value money because it can take years to resolve. I remember when Enron, USA had some small losses with Enron. Those things were in the courts for years and years and years and years. So yeah, you might get 30 cents on the dollar, but that may be 30 cents over several years. So that recovery rate is exaggerated because if it's 30%, it's 30%, but you got to do it time value money of that. So maybe it drops down to 25 or 20, but we're just going to use recovery rates as they are. Um, so the, the both of these are taken in consideration. They're probably the fault and your likely recovery rate. Now there's a correlation between recovery rates and ratings. Triple A bonds, you get higher recovery than single B bonds. So there's a relationship between those two. So probably the best way to do this is to show you actual exam questions because it's, it is a really a very, very straightforward question. Uh, this is this is the answer, so you don't, you're not given that. But here's the question. So I give you this report. I actually have an update of this that I'll 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 get because I've I've been having trouble with S and P Moody's. You used to be able to get their credit default history. Now, when you click on it, they ask for your login number and name and all that, and, and they're expensive. So these, this is old, but I did find one this last this last uh, couple of months. I can't remember if it was S&P or Moody's. I gave some updated numbers, so I'll give updated numbers. I doubt they're radically different, but if you look at it, I give the one, three, five, and 10 years. I won't tell the fo focus on the 10 year. So what it says is what percentage of AAA bonds default within one year, within three years, within five years, within 10 years. If I could get an updated one of these, this is the type of schedule I would carry with me if I were a finance major, because this is this is pretty important stuff. So AAA bond has about a 1% chance of default. Double A says 2.5%. I don't know how much Enron was in that one number. But two and a half percent, single A, three and three and a half. So I might think of it as one percent, two and a half percent, three and a half percent, or the high rated. That's over 10 years. All right. You notice the big jump when you go down to triple B, seven percent. Then when you get down in in the below investment grade, you're down to 20 percent, 30 percent. And then when you get the, the C's, over half of them. But you think about that, wow, that sounds terrible, over half of them, but still, if you buy a triple C bond. Almost half of them will survive. <laughs> so you could make a fortune off of those because they're going to be up dramatically in price. But a typical investment grade bond, about 5% of them will default over 10 years. And below investment grade, about a third of them. 
Um, so let's think about these numbers for double A, so 250. That's over 10 years. It's 2.5%. So how much spread do you need to cover that? Do you need 250 basis points to cover that? So what does the spread pay you? Is that the number it pays you over 10 years or is that the spread you get that every year? Every year. Every year, right? This is your loss over 10 years. So what do you need annually? You're going to lose 250 basis points over 10 years. How much spread do you need every year to cover that? 25. 25 bips. Pretty simple. That divided by 10. So this bond spread should be at least 25 basis points. But that ignores what? Well, I mean, we don't know when the timing of this. We know this is every year. So, yeah, it's not so much time value money. I mean, the time value money is where I'm talking about on recovery, right? So if you're ever going to recover 40%, what spread do you need? It's going to be 0 0.0025 times 1 minus 40%, right? If you're going to recover 40%, you're going to lose 60%. So you need to be paid 25 basis points less 60%. So you'll lose 25 basis points, but you'll get 40% um, of that back. I'm sorry, you need 60% you need of that 25 basis points. So 15 basis points would cover you pretty well for a double A bond. You got 15 basis points extra spread a year that would cover you. And I think I showed y'all, but we'll look at it again. So how many basis points does the double A give you? Average 83 basis points. Does it sound like you're being compensated for your risk? You need 15. It's paying you 83. Sounds like a pretty good deal. Doesn't sound bad at all. Y'all see what I'm, where we're going here? Let's try another one just to make sure everybody's with me here. Let's try double B. Well, let's try triple B. Triple B. On average, about 7% will default, 7.1%. So how many basis points do you need to cover the probability of default? 71. 71 basis points. And let's say the recovery is 40%. What do you need? Uh, 71 you need, basis points times 0.6. Yeah, you need 60% of 71 basis points. So 7.11%. That divided by 10, you need 71 basis points to cover you for the probability of default. But if you're going to get 40% back. You only need 60% of that. So you need about 42 basis points. Oh, sorry. I put that in the wrong spot. 43 basis points. What do you actually get for triple B? 178. Does that sound like a good investment? All right. So I remember to, I, I probably told you all this story before, but. When I started as a security analyst, I never bought a bond before, so I went out and bought a treasury bond. I just wanted to go out. I'd never done it before. We did have the internet back then. So I went out to Treasury Direct, and I set up an account, and I bought a treasury for the first time in my life. Now I do it on swap. But back then, 5000 bucks. I only did it just to figure out how the system worked. I wanted to see how the auction process worked. All that kind of stuff. Only reason I did it. The next day, the head of the department heard about it and got really mad at me. He's like, we don't buy treasuries at USA. And I said, I didn't buy USA a treasury. I bought a treasury myself. But he was adamant, USA does not buy treasuries. Why doesn't USA buy treasuries? Because they're saying you're getting paid 
for your risk from corporates. Why buy treasuries when you're getting paid three, four times more than you need for the corporate? That was his argument. The next day he apologized. He like overreacted. It was like, it's like sorry, I just, <laughs> this is only 5,000 bucks. Um, but yeah, we kind of talked about that with the video I showed you that a lot of bond investors don't buy treasuries. They buy corporates. So when you talk about, you know, the diversification of, of bonds, you don't really get that with corporates as much as you do with treasuries because corporates are more highly rated or correlated to to um, stocks than treasuries are. So let's look at this question. So let's read the question. Below is a summary of the cumulative default rate. So it's cumulative. So obviously this row column has to be lower than that column because you're adding up across. <laughs> Historical recovery rates have been as high as 60% for AAA, but around 40% for others over, over the 10 years. If the current spread is 170 basis points, comment on adequacy of that spread to cover your risk. So just like what we did, we took 711 basis points divided by 10, we got 71 basis points. We multiply that by one minus the 0.4, so we need 42.66 basis points to cover us for the risk. The actual spread we're getting is um, 170 basis points or more than covered for the default risk in that case. There's a few things you have to worry about though. I, I now said add the last one. You know, There is some uh, time value of money on recoveries. I don't care if you put that on the exam, but that is that is true. So why do you get paid so much more? Well, there's more to the risk of corporate bonds than just um, the fall. So it's also that correlation, right? They don't give you as much diversification as treasuries do. So in a year like 2008, when stocks are crashing, what are corporate bonds doing? They're crashing as well. So you're getting a little bit extra paid for that. You also just have spread risk. Spread risk is that spreads gap out and your price falls, even though your default may not have gone up. That's kind of a similar kind of thing. But, you know, it's this idea that spread risk, maybe the best way to say this is spread spreads are the level of spreads, are they positively correlated to stock markets or negatively correlated to stock markets? When the stock market crashes, are spreads going up or are they coming down? They're going up. Going up. So it's negatively correlated. Spreads are what? What's the word we use? Widening. So I think that correlation is part of the reason corporate bonds give you more spread. It still seems like too much to me. And I think that's why USA is like, yeah, we're not going to buy treasuries. Why would we? Now, right now, I think treasuries are, are a pretty good deal. I'm kind of um, amazed. Um, just the, the incredible uh, rate that treasuries are at. I mean, they're a lot better than CDs. Um, and CDs should be the same risk. So and even corporates, they're corporate spreads are just not wide enough given all the uncertainties going on. So I think treasuries are a pretty good investment right now. So that's the real, real key to why this might be the case, I think is the correlation argument. Treasuries are a wonderful diversifier with the one exception we talked about, inflation. But when you're talking about a crisis or a recession, treasuries are going to do well. Corporates didn't do well in 08. Um, now, recently, high yield has a, had a positive return this last, return this last year where, where uh, treasuries are down. But again, that's interest rates are rising. Um, but you don't need you don't need high yield to protect you because stocks are up. The fact that high yields up, that's just part of that correlation argument. All right. Pretty simple question, right? It's not not that complex. There uh, wouldn't be a bad thing to bring up. In an interview, you know, say, man, you know, corporate spreads is looking at them. Boy, they really compensate you for a default risk, uh, especially if you're interviewing with Victory Capital since they buy corporate bonds. You know, you want to kind of make sure you're on their team. You don't want to go, what do you do? You buy corporate bonds. You don't want to do that. You want to be on their side. They're buying corporate bonds. 
All right, let's try another one. It's almost the same question all over again. That's not part of the question. Anybody remember what OAS is? Uh, can you define it? Yeah, it's uh, the credit risk. So the credit credit of the spread you have related to the credit risk. So the risk, credit risk, right? Takes the spread you're getting for the option. So yeah, so. Um, all right, so here, everything's exactly the same, but here we're looking at a single light bond. We haven't done that yet. What's how much spread you need for a single A bond? So the default rate's about 3.6%. So you need 36.2 basis points on average every year to cover you for that default risk, but you're going to recover 40%. I don't have the math in here. I might have had it in here and just, just, just took it out. So you need 36.2 BIPs. 36.2 times 1 minus 0.4 is 21.7. You're actually getting paid 60. I don't know what the 98 is doing there. That's interesting that I just typed that. So you're getting paid more than three times what you need to cover you for the risk. But let me look at um, the spread risk. So in 2008, single A bonds were paying 5.77. On average, you need 21. In 2008, they were paying 577 basis points. So who was buying corporates in 2008? Do y'all know? Have y'all heard of this guy? What tree, what, what tree, what company is he at? Oak Tree Capital? So I think you have to be a customer of his, his write-ups. He's really famous for his famous uh, blogs that he writes, but you have to be a customer. I, I have some friends that are his customer, but they only send me his blogs when they think it's really interesting. I wish they'd just send me all of them. <laughs> but I, I don't know Howard Marks. I mean, not personally, but he's out there on YouTube. Warren's governments can't keep us aloft forever. Hard marks once a lockdown financial event is here. When did you do that? Three weeks ago. I don't know what that is. I want to listen to that right now, actually. <laughs> he he's really famous for his one-liners. So you could you could start a t-shirt shop where you just put hard marks quotes on the t-shirt and you could make a fortune because he he has these one-liners. He wrote a book. Um I don't remember the name of it. Uh, it's like the most important thing or something. Is that it? Yeah, the most important thing. So in the first chapter, the most important thing is this. In the second chapter, this most important thing is this. So he has like 10 most important things. Um, but I, it's a good book. I don't know if it's like one of my top, top three or four, but it's, it's a good book. Um, but famous guy. So in, at the end of 2008, he was buying hundreds of millions of dollars of corporates when everybody else was fleeing the market. And he talks about it in some of these YouTubes about how do you walk into a market when everybody's just scared to death and you're the one buyer? Uh, how do you handle something like that? So he was he was a buyer in that market. So very famous guy. I'd highly recommend you watch his YouTubes. He's just he's just he knows how to keep you interested. Um, I don't know why he's talking about stocks here. He doesn't know anything about stocks. He is a uh, he is a bond guy, definitely. All right, simple question, right? Everybody should get one hundred percent on that. I do want you to comment on why it might be the case. So you just have to talk about the fact that spreads, you know, they tend to gap out when stocks are crashing. It doesn't give you quite the correlation benefit um, that the treasury would. Now, there's a new term out there I don't use. I called my friends at Victory Capital because this term was created since I retired, but it's called spread duration. I don't know if y'all heard that term before. Um, it didn't make sense to me at first, but 
you know, you know what duration is, right? Duration tells you if rates rise or fall, how, how the stock price, how the bond price is going to move. So spread duration is how does the bond market price move when spreads gap out and in. But that sounds the same thing as duration, right? Because what happened, what do interest rates do when spreads widen? The rate goes up. Isn't that the same as the rate going up? So, but I finally understood it. I, what happened these last few weeks with some, some bonds. I finally understand what spread duration means. Uh, but it re reflects the potential change of the bond's value in response to 100 basis points change in the spread. All right. Um, it's essentially just asking what kind of credit risk you have. So it's it's kind of related to what we're talking about here is spreads can change in, in unpredictable ways in a crisis. How exposed are you to that? But that term didn't exist when I was working. So it's I don't know who invented it, but it's a fairly recent, fairly recent phenomenon. All right, any, I don't think I have anything else on credit. Well, how do you mitigate credit risk limits? As you saw in your bank write-up, you just say how much you're gonna have in any one company, how much you're gonna have in any one industry. Uh, aggregate limits across uh, the enterprise or different type of investments. You wanna have strong covenants in your bonds to try to prevent event risk. And there are default credit default swaps, which I don't understand. I've never done them. They don't sound like swaps to me. They sound like options to me. And I always have someone say, oh, let me explain it to you so you'll see it. And they'll explain it to me and say, yeah, that sounds like an option. What you just said doesn't sound like a swap. So I don't, I'm not comfortable with them. I've never purchased one or sold one. So I can't say any of our CDS people in here. It's not, so, huh? That's what I'm familiar with. Did you ever purchase one? Or yeah. yeah, they're they're strange animals. They really are very strange. I mean, AIG went under because of their credit default swaps that they were selling. So uh, it's a it's an interesting world. At USA, it was interesting. We had a new CEO, and it's my job to set our limits. So I said, okay, what we're going to do is how much can we have with any one bond as a percentage of our net worth depending on their ratings. So if they're AAA rated, we can have 5%. If they're single A rated, we have X. So I took that to the CEO and he says, no, no, those, those are too high. Go back and run your model and let me, give me another number. And I didn't have a model. So I went back to my desk and wrote it down a lower number and went back to him <laughs> and said, what about 4%? No, no, that's too high. Go run your model again. So I finally go, okay, Bob, um, I don't have a model. What number can I write down that you can go to sleep tonight? And he gave me a number that was really low, really, really low. And I knew I was in trouble. So I go back and I call the bond guys and says, okay, here's the new number. Uh, it's like 2%. And they thought I was joking. They laughed. They laughed every time I called. Uh, <laughs> I said, no, that's the new numbers. They, they were used to buying bonds in $500 million blocks. And now instead of buying one bond in $500 million blocks, they're going to have to buy 50 bonds. I mean, it radically changed what they're doing. They were so mad at me. They're always mad at me. Whose fault was it? It wasn't my fault. It was the CEO's fault, but they're all mad at me. They would cuss me out all mad. And then they get in a meeting with the CEO. I say, oh, yeah, that sounds good. That makes sense. So, yeah, that's not what y'all were saying yesterday. <laughs> and so we had a list of our 10 largest exposures before he changed the policy. Anyone want to guess what our number one exposure was before he changed this policy? Any guesses on famous bonds in history? Maybe Houston-oriented bonds? Enron. Enron was our top exposure. And they were so mad they had to sell Enron. It went from several hundred million dollars down to about 40 million. It's like, Ron, you're an idiot. He doesn't know what he's doing. This guy's crazy. And then Enron blew up. But we didn't have much exposure. And so I remember John called me. He might be smarter than we think he is. And so it changed everything. It was... Pretty, pretty amazing. Probably more luck than anything else that he just happened to change it right before that happened. But yeah, they had to sell all their in run down very, very, very low and it's, it saved us a fortune. But there's really no way to set the risk limit in any, there's no mathematical way to say, hey, you should have X percent or whatever. You just have to figure out what you're comfortable with. Um, but when you set it really low, you're, you're forcing your bond managers to buy a lot more bonds, which remember when we talk about diversification, that kind of moves you from familiarity 
to reverse you know they had it's really tough on bonds they do a lot of research on the bonds so they had to find a lot more names to buy so it was it was an interesting process well uh there's your bond ratings we're going to talk about that all right now we're going to go real quickly through just some miscellaneous risk uh, if we have time to do our case studies we're going to do a basis risk case study so basis risk or tracking risk is when you're hedging something and what you're hedging and what you're hedging with don't go together. So what you're hedging goes down, you want your hedge to go up, but it doesn't. And you end up with a loss. I saw, I showed you that for our pension plan at USA, except for it was the opposite, where our hedging went down and what we're using to hedge went up and we ended up with this big gain, but that could have gone the other direction. So how do you measure that? Well, you actually use tracking error, just like I talked about with uh, your investment manager. You look at the return of your what you're hedging, the return of what you're hedging with, and you do correlations and standard deviations of that, that tracking error. Um, that risk is another proper way of measuring it. You look at the difference. Let's say, okay, the hedge, what I'm hedging is down 2%, and my hedge was up 1.9. Next month, okay, look, it was, what I was hedged was up 3%, what I'm hedging with is down 3.5%. You take that difference, kind of like an alpha, and you take the standard deviation of that, and you can run a value at risk. Say, what's what's the biggest difference we could have between these two? So I can tell management. Management thinks we're hedged. I can tell them there's a case where what we're hedging is down 10 million, but our hedge is only up 6 million. So just be aware of that. We may not be perfectly hedged on that. So uh, it's not a difficult thing to calculate. And then what you really have to do is when do you really want the hedge to work? Well, in a crisis where there's a good chance those two things act very differently in a crisis. And so that's when you're a little bit scared. Like with our pension plan, it was in the middle of a crisis where our swaps did great, but the the, the uh, liability was down. That's just because that scenario was just so different than any other scenario. Um, you try to match as close as you can. So there are some matches that are perfect. If you own a Vanguard S&P 500 index fund and you sell S&P 500 futures, you're hedged. I mean, there's there's really no no risk there. I mean, you might be off of basis points or something. You're just not going to even notice it. Well, that's pretty close. If you have a million dollars in a NASDAQ fund and you sell S&P 500 futures, you may be in a lot of trouble, especially given how much that fund is up. That wouldn't have worked at all in 2000. So you try to match as closely as you possibly can. That may mean you're going to use some of those over-counter, over-the-counter derivatives like swaps to try to get things just matched up a lot more precisely because you have more control over that. Be aware of this. Don't tell your boss you're hedged if the hedge and what you're hedging with have any noise whatsoever. Be ready to tell them, hey, we're we're pretty well hedged. However, looking historically, we could be off this much. The nice thing you have is you have 2008 and 2020. You have two pretty extreme cases that you can go back and look and see. Um, so that's that's kind of nice just to know that, you know, if you have data back that far. We're going to talk a basis risk, a really famous case from Germany related to oil prices. Hopefully we'll get to that and I'll show you, show you that case. Any questions on tracking? Another cool thing about this is if this comes up in an interview, you'll sound really smart if you use the phrase basis risk, because that always sounds, you, you don't sound like a finance student, right? You sound like a professional. So, But do you know how to use basis risk in an interview? That's that's the key. So he's like, yeah, that'd be a good, that'd be a good hedge. It, it has a little bit of basis risk, but I think, I think it'd work. That sounds pretty sophisticated, doesn't it? So hopefully you say it at the right time. I mean, I'm not like when they ask how was your weekend or something, but you're actually talking about something that makes sense. All right, model risk is a, is one you're all going to experience. The actuary is more so than anybody else because they're they're worse at this than anybody else because that's all they do is models all day long. But finance people um, are bad at it as well. Um, you create a model. A model is a simplified version of real life. And the model is extremely complex. And the more complex it is, the more people think it must be good. Is that true? <laughs> the more complicated a model, does that mean it's more likely to be a really good model? 
And so the more complex it is, the more management re relaxes because say, wow, we got our most sophisticated people. You should see those formulas they're using and they go on for pages. They're using advanced calculus and whatever um, must be good. And I don't know if y'all heard this phrase before, garbage in, gospel out. Is that possible? No, it's garbage in, garbage out. But because it's so complex, people think it's got must be gospel coming out. And we're going to talk about that when we talk about uh, Doug Hubbard. That sometimes these kind of he he hates heat maps. We'll talk about heat maps. Heat maps is that kind of thing, where it's this really sophisticated looking thing. And Hubbard says it actually it's worse than nothing. You're doing something, you're spending all this time, you have these fancy charts. He says it's worse than doing nothing. And why is it worse than doing nothing? Because management says, look at all the stuff we're doing. We can relax. We don't need to worry. And they should be worried because nothing's been fixed. So uh, it's it's a pretty pretty difficult problem. The model risk is, is a measure of complexity. How complex is the model? The more uh, formulas it has, just the worse it is. My worst... Our experience was the CEO looked at our model and he says, Ron, there's no way that's right. I said, I'm sure it's right. We doubled and tripled and whatever, checked it. He says, okay, it just doesn't look right to me. And I'm thinking that everything he's saying is correct. That that doesn't look right. But I'm like, no, we tripled. So I'll go back to Susie's desk. You know, Susie, this is what he says. She said, well, let me look. And she goes, and, and what words did she say that I didn't want to hear? Uh-oh. Uh yeah, uh-oh. I I learned that uh-oh is also uh-oh in Spanish. And when I was throwing a Frisbee off the side of the mountain. Um, but uh-oh, yeah, that's what she said. Uh-oh, that's like, what? Oh, we forgot the dude. So now what I do, we found an error and I just assured the CEO that we'd have, so very frustrating. So one lesson is don't ever tell your CEO we're sure it's right, because you're not. <laughs> just say, what, what should I have said? You know what? You know, that's a good question. Let me go back and double check. Just say that even if you are really that sure. Just say that. Say, let me go back and double check. Make sure. Susie and Kirby were in that department. The smartest people I know. I just assumed as smart as they were, it must be right. So anyway, she felt really bad, but she didn't take any of the heat part. So um, how do you mitigate this? You test. So I'm going to give you one trick that I think is really, really effective. How do you figure out if model works? go to the extremes, do something so radical. So if your model involves oil prices, take oil prices to $400, take them to $5 and see what your model says. That's at the, at, you should know at the extremes, like, wow, if oil hits four, $400, someone say, well, they'll never hit $400. Yeah, that's fine. But I just want to see, what does the model say? You do $400 as, oh, yeah, that, that can't be right. It should be much worse than that. There's obviously something wrong. So a lot of models fall apart at the extreme, which means they probably weren't working in the more normal scenarios. Double check, triple check them. Uh, when I got USA out of mortgage backed securities, I, I went to the CFO and said, okay, Joe, we're about to move, you know, about $15 billion here based on a model I built that no one else in this company has looked at, just letting you know. And I left the room, just and FYI. So he said, we'll get someone down to Ron's desk, but he never did. They did that entire thing, you know, so I doubled and triple, triple checked it, but you know, how many of you are going to have an Excel model with an error in it yeah. in here? How many are not? How many are going to never have an error? How many are going to have a model with an error in it that makes a bad mistake and you never know and no one ever knows? That's going to happen, right? It's just the nature of these Excel. Excel is wonderful, this great over, open ar architecture, but there's errors everywhere. It's just... It's something you just got to be aware of. Um, you can't help yourself with how you design the model. If you design your models, one thing I learned real quickly is to design my Excel so that if a complete stranger comes in, they'll know exactly what I did. That makes it easier for them to check it and see what I'm doing. So don't have formulas that go on 200 characters. Break out the formulas and the pieces, show your work as you go. And I can't actuaries. I don't know what y'all do. Y'all don't even use Excel, right? It's a SQL and whatever so but in sap yeah but but y'all do a lot of models right that's your job as an actuary is to do a lot of models and they're making huge decisions the entire insurance company goes insolvent the actuaries make mistakes so it's extremely important they probably do have a process for checking uh, one of the actuaries i worked with mary 
we were we we're doing this model and I was like, Mary, you have your numbers? She's like, no, I think I can get it better. I said, Mary, I need your numbers. And she was like constantly reworking her model. It's so irritating. I was like, isn't it good enough? I just needed a number because we had a meeting in two days. Said, no, no, no. I, I, I'm going to say all night and work on it. It's like, no, it doesn't have to be that accurate. Um, so good model design. And then admit your errors really quickly. In fact, up front, you say, you know, yeah, we need to go back and double check this one more time. Um, have someone else look at it, but, you know, whatever you can do, because the systems are being made on, on these models that we're building. Um, and we make mistakes and don't really even think about it. It's just some really obvious, obvious mistakes. Uh, there's a good book out there, The Signal and the Noise. Nate Silver is somewhat famous for some of his predictions. <clears throat> Um, have any of you ever read this book? I think I have on my book reading list. It's a pretty easy read. And what I love about his book is how many different examples he gives um, on just the importance of understanding model risk. Here's a couple of broke good quotes. All models are wrong. Some are useful. That's a great quote. And I heard this at a conference, an actuarial conference. And they said, models are not evidence. Isn't that a great quote? Um, so you can say, yeah, but my model said so. Yeah, but that doesn't mean that's evidence because your model is reflecting real life. It doesn't make sense. Um, I think I got the garbage in gospel out. I don't think Peter Bernstein said it, but I think it's like a conference where Peter Bernstein spoke. So y'all heard of Peter Bernstein, he wrote Capital Ideas. He's passed away, but he was at a conference but I think an actuary spoke right after him and used that phrase, and I wrote it down. Um, it was pretty cool because I go to this conference, I had no idea what Peter Bernstein was speaking, and I came with his book because I was reading it. <laughs> and so I get his autograph. And I even tell him, I didn't know you were going to be here, and I got your book. And he's like, yeah, yeah, whatever. And he didn't care, but it was a <laughs> great guy. I do recommend his books. Here's, here's a quote that's a little bit older. Have you all heard of Aristotle? A couple thousand years ago. It is a mark of an educated person to look for precision only as far as the nature of the subject allows. That's a great quote as well. That can work very well for all of us. Um, I had a big debate with the accountants once because they changed the tax law. So the travel mills didn't get taxed the same as other travel costs. So they wanted me to forecast out the next five years and they wanted me to forecast out travel mills for five years. I didn't know we were traveling next year but they wanted me to go out five years. Why? Because a lot of accountants, sorry if there's accountants in there, a lot of accountants think the more detailed you do in a forecast, the more accurate it is. And I don't believe that at all. What should they have done? They should have gone back and looked historically what percentage travel was mills and just apply a factor and, and be done with it. But we didn't know we were traveling. I had a guy that ran our gold fund. Sometimes he would go to South Africa. It depends, you know, if there's a, a major strike going on, he's not going to go. I don't know. I know like two months beforehand. I'm supposed to forecast five years out. So I'm like, oh, we'll go to Chicago in September. Or we'll go here. You know, it's, <laughs> who know, but that's fine. What should you do? Just last year we spent 20,000 on travel. Let's put 21,000. That would have been good enough. They want to try me to schedule every trip, what city, what my meals were. Just ridiculous stuff. So don't, don't think going to more detail is going to make things more accurate. And then Doug Hubbard, he's not quite as uh, succinct as Aristotle. Ineffective methods are used. So what is he talking about? Do y'all know what heat maps are? I get y'all in a lot of trouble, man. Who knows what a heat map is? Do y'all use them in your firms? Hey, let's see. He hates heat maps, and so do I. See if I can find, here we go. There's a heat map. Does that look looking familiar now? So it's severity and, and frequency. So something that's low severity, is low risk, something that's high severity is high risk. Something that's low frequency is low risk, something that's high frequency. The worst case would be high frequency and high severity. All right? 
that'd be jumping out of a plane without a parachute. What percentage of time will you be injured? 100% of the time, how injured will you be? Depends on how many feet. I've heard people dropping from pretty far up and surviving, but it's still kind of damaging. It's still, what would be low frequency, low severity? What did we talk about last night in my PNC class? Alien ab abduction? Oh. <laughs> what's, the, what's the probability of alien abduction? Pretty, pretty low. And what's the severity? They're talking about, you know, mental anguish and that kind of thing. So who knows? Um, so that's what a heat map is. A lot of firms do this. It's so colorful. They have these massive bounders, binders with these things in them. Why does Doug Hubbard hate these things? So they're so incredibly subjective. So at USA, they use heat maps. They say, Ron, what are your low frequency, high severity maps? So what's low frequency? Oh, 1%. 1%, okay. So you're telling me if there's a, a firm that does a um, sky jumping, skydiving, and they do 10,000 a year, and they only had uh, 100 deaths last year that you would use that firm, because that's pretty low frequency, isn't it? And you, would y'all use that firm? That, how many how many deaths from skydiving hit the newspapers? Every one of them. If you saw a firm with 100 articles a year, of deaths for skydiving, would you consider that low frequency? So 1% doesn't sound like low frequency to me. If you're talking about a 2% stock market drop, 1% sounds pretty, pretty, weak. you know, so first of all, what's the def definition of low frequency? And then what's the definition of severity? Is it a billion, 10 billion, the firm goes insolvent? Who knows? So um, yeah, it's, we don't like these because no one really defines what frequency and severity is. And each department answers it their own way. So you got this hodgepodge of stuff that's not statistically accurate or consistent at all. So you'll see Doug Hubbard doesn't like this. So what does he say about these things? But be careful when you interview, don't bad mouth heat maps because there are firms that believe this stuff is like, I've had some of my graduate students like, oh no, we do it really, really well. And I'll hear what they say and say, yeah, everything you're saying is exactly what Doug Hubbard hates. So, but I don't, you know, I said, sorry, I'm gonna step on your toes. Um, anybody want to defend heat maps in here? What What's the argument? Well, at least we're doing something, right? What does Doug Hubbard say? No, that's worse than doing nothing. But So ineffective methods are used with great confidence, even though they add error to the evaluation. Perhaps much effort is spent on seemingly sophisticated methods. It does feel sophisticated, right? Because there's just so many pages. And it's so pretty. All those greens and reds and yellows are like, wow, look how pretty it is. But there is still no objective, measurable evidence. And here's the key: we're gonna we're gonna do some Doug Hubbard here. He says, if it's a good technique, then the firm should be less risky after doing it than before doing it. And he says, there's no measurable objective evidence that using heat maps makes the firm a better risk managed firm. These sophisticated methods are far worse than doing nothing. All right. Does that seem like a pretty bold statement to make? They cause erroneous decisions to be taken that otherwise would not have been made. Note that in this spectrum, doing nothing is actually not the worst case. Doing something that's ineffective but seems sophisticated is worse than doing nothing. It is in the middle of the list. Those firms evoking infamous, I'm at, at least I'm doing something defense, are likely to fare worse. Doing nothing is not as bad as things can get. The worst thing to do is to adopt a soft scoring method. That's exactly, he means heat maps. He's not talking about anything else here than heat maps. Are an unproven but semi sophisticated method, what some have called crackpot rigor, and act on it with high confidence. I highly recommend that book. It's such a good book. We're gonna watch a video of him where he goes through some of the, his techniques. Um, it's pretty, pretty effective guy. Really great guy. I think I told you I called right at, that I called him. Remember that story? Did I tell you all this story? I can't remember what I told you, but yeah, I called his firm to try to get him to come to UTSA and his secretary says, well, he's in the office. Do you want to talk to him? And it's like, so I got to talk to him, but oh man, all he wants to do is talk risk. Because he kept telling me, I got to run to a meeting, I got to run to a meeting. He talked into the 10, 15 minutes. I didn't keep him on the phone. He just kept talking. He loves talking. I would love to get stuck on a plane for a five-hour flight next to this guy. It would be an incredible 
Um, I think when you see his videos, you should watch his videos. They are quite, quite good. Um, he has a view of him and speaking at conferences that are really, really good. Um, but great, great guy. Uh, he's written a couple books that are quite good, but this is this is my favorite. The Failure of Risk Ma Management, Why It Is Broken and How to Fix It. He does have recommendations that he talks about in the video we're going to talk about. So if you interview at USA's Risk Management Retirement, I wouldn't bring this stuff up because they use heat maps and they love them. But I wouldn't, and you're, you would be stepping on their toes. But you probably don't want to work for the department if you agree with, with Doug Hubbard because you're going to be doing stuff that he calls what? Yeah, bring this up in the interview. Yeah, doesn't USA use Crackpot River in their risk management process? That's probably not going to go over well. All right, any questions on, on model risk? This is a huge risk for everyone in this room. You're all going to be in there in Excel doing all kinds of fancy things, and there's going to be a major, major, major problem somewhere. And you'll find it out while you're walking into the CEO's office to present. All right, legal risk. <clears throat> you have a contract and you think it's enforceable, it ends up not being enforceable, or it's interpreted in a different way. You have to really understand the contract in a different way. The purpose of a contract is to shift risk. Think of that as the number one purpose of a contract. The purpose of a contract is when something goes wrong, who bears the risk? And if you read a contract in that context, it, it changes what you're looking for. So I only, I've only sued one time and I sued my apartment complex because I hated their contract. I refused to sign their contract. It was a horrible contract but it shifted all this risk on me that I didn't want. And I sued them because they didn't, give, they didn't give my deposit back. And the contract clearly said, the contract I didn't like clearly said they're gonna give my deposit back. So I sued them and won. It wasn't worth the effort, but it was worth the, uh, just the fact that they made me so mad. Um, but yeah, read a contract in that context. Who is bearing the risk? So when you read a sentence and they say, you know, if this happens, you're gonna do this. Read that and say, do I want that risk? Don't read it in context of, well, that probably will never happen. Because that's the whole reason why it's in the contract, is in case that happens. That's the reason you wrote it. So you need to actually ask, what happens if this happens? Do I Am I going to bear that? Do my, does my boss want me to do that? How long is the contract? We talked about the swap contract earlier. I remember all those pages, how complicated it was. Um, that creates risk. And then how do you mitigate it? You know, I couldn't change our swap contract because it was just too standardized, but other contracts, and I did have to write a lot of contracts and you probably will as well. You think lawyers write contracts, but they don't know what you're doing. They'll have you write a big pun of a part of it. Um, you, you need to say what you want, make it really, really clear. And if you think about writing a contract that its purpose is to shift risk, then you start writing a contract saying, what if this happens? What if this happens? What if someone gets injured? What if interest rates rise? Um, you know, all these kind of things you want to think through and then say, what do I want to have happen in that scenario? And that's how you write your contract. All right. So shift your focus on contracts to be in risk, risk documents. Um, never trust the lawyers. I'll say, I don't understand what this paragraph means. If, will it do this? And I say, oh, yeah, yeah, trust us. It says, well, no, well, let's say that. I want it to specifically say that that's what's going to happen. Don't tell me that, yeah, that's probably what's going to happen. I want to I want to see it in writing. Uh, lawyers are trained to sound like they know what they're talking about. Why? Because they have one goal, and that's to get you out of their office. They're going to say whatever it takes. Why? Because they're really busy people. Look at their inbox. It's like this. And their in outbox is empty, right? So they're busy people. They're smart people, but they're busy people, and they're really good at getting you out of the office. Don't ask them yes or no questions. <laughs> um, don't say, if this happens, will I get this? Oh, yeah. Let's say, if this happens, what will I get? Let's walk through the scenario. I want to see you do the math here, all right? So contracts are tough. I think part of the problem is I understand y'all don't take business law anymore. I was hearing that from my other class. It just shocks me. We had to take six hours of business law. and Y'all don't take any hours at all. That just shocks me. Y'all don't have the UCC. Uh, yeah, it just amazes me. That's like business law. You need to take a business law class on your own because you'll be writing contracts. 
but um, yeah. All right, any questions on legal risk? There are there are some famous cases. There is one of a uh, a city or county in, in uh, the UK that had a swap contract, and it ended up where they were have they were supposed to pay, and someone decided, hey, you weren't legally you didn't have legal capacity to enter this contract, and so the state said, yeah, they they weren't allowed to sign this contract, so they just canceled the contract, and the other side lost all this kind of money. They had a contract; it was all signed, everything was in place. But someone says, no, this entity is not legally allowed. And that's probably the biggest loss on swaps from a credit standpoint. All right. Oh, this is an irritating one. Do we have accountants in here? I think we do. Uh, all right. So disclosure risk. So here's when the accountants make your life miserable. You can't do what you want to do to manage risk because the disclosure is so overwhelming. Whether it's the accountants, it's the legal, regulatory, whatever, you just you need to hire a staff of twenty people just to keep track of the records. You can't do it. Accounting is probably the biggest one because of what you have to report. The basis risk case going to give you is also the disclosure risk case because of confusion between accounting in the U.S. and in, in Germany. Um, how do you measure it? Is how many pages are the rules? So I may have told you this story, but yeah, when I did my first derivative, FAS 133 came up. My boss brought these big books over to my desk and said, here, read this. It's like, yeah, it, it's, it's complicated stuff. Fortunately, we had an, a new accountant we just hired from Pete Marrick who knew all the rules. And so I just went to him and made sure. And I did the same thing I would have done with lawyers. What if this happens? What if this happens? Walk me through it. How does the accounting look? Um, we're going to see with the basis risk issue or case um what happened with this entity is the hedge was in pretty good shape but the accounting wasn't so the hedge was probably it wasn't great but it was okay but the accounting made it look horrible because what the accounting did was it wrote down one part of the transaction but it didn't allow them to write out the hedge part so it looked like they had these huge loss they really had this huge gain but they didn't get to record that and that was just the way the accounting worked um, and so it just caused the more the panic. So that's the disclosure risk. Um, how do you mitigate this? So here's my recommendation. Be really friendly with lawyers and accountants. Right? Treat them extremely well and get to them very early in the process. So at USA I had the accountants, I had the tax and add lawyers. And I tried to be as nice and sweet to those people as I possibly could be. Um, now, fortunately, USA on the tax side, had a, my good friend was head of taxes. So I had kind of, I could always go to her and say, I got this. And they knew when I was coming that something bad was going to happen, that they had to research something. But they, USA had the best tax research department. They were really good at it. I bring them something. He come back with a report, 16 pages, had done all his work and exactly, we'll talk about it when we talk about tax risk. It did work on the accounting side. We'll talk about on the currency side. The issue USA had some accounting is really complex, and if I'm doing a derivative for the first time and no accountant has ever done that before, you're asking an awful lot of an accountant who's already busy working a lot of hours. That's really tough research, right? Now I'm a CPA, so they could have said, well, "Ron, you do your own research," but they really can't do that. They've got to take charge because they have to do the accounting entries. Remember that swap that we did. There's no accounting entry for that when you do it because the market value is zero, but 10 minutes later, you do have to do an accounting entry. So there's no cash, nothing changes hands, there's market value zero. The accountants have got to figure out how to do that transaction, which means they probably have to have access to a Bloomberg terminal, which they, they did. Um, so you have the same thing with the large. So get to them early in the process. The last thing you want to do is take your idea for approval and the CEO says, have you run this by the tax department or the accounting department and the head of taxes says no i've never seen this before you're you're done for you're dead you're gonna be in bad shape so get to those people early walk in you know like, like amy i got this project man your team is so good at research uh, you know you you butter them up i hope amy doesn't watch this uh you butter them up it's like man they were i mean i'm not lying they were exceptional tax department um 
I almost kind of, kind of think they liked the research because it gave them something new to work on. It was kind of out of the ordinary. But go to them early. Um, and they're busy, so they're probably not going to make you their top priority. So, it's, you know, work this into your plan. What a lot of finance people do is they get everything approved and then they go to tax and accounting at the last last step. And that's just the wrong idea because now, I was, yeah, here I got this big project. I need it tomorrow at noon. And they're, they're not going to like that. And they don't have to answer to you. They don't have to do anything you ask them anyway. You're begging them to begin with. Uh, so, and then you just have to have a lot of people. Um, yeah, when the regulations came out in 2008, USA had to hire staff just to do that one piece of legislation. You know, this stuff can be really tough. You can hire lobbyists. What's your view of lobbyists? Does that sound like a good word or a bad word? Pretty negative, isn't it? To most people, I would have thought that. But USA have really, they were. I thought they were pretty good. They understood our business. They were quick to understand when we say, "Wow, we really hate this law." They was they would understand real quickly why we hate it, and they actually did a pretty good job of, of fighting stuff for us. So you know, you you can do that to try to keep some new reg from coming in. But disclosure risk, you can handle really by just managing it in your process. Get the people early. Give them time. You got busy people. They're already working overtime. Your project's something new that they didn't have on their list. Realize all that and get to them early and start talking to them. Um, yeah, so there's times where disclosure is going to kill a great idea. Here's the Dodd-Frank. This is an article from The Economist when this came out. So I recommend that book, right? I do recommend that Dodd-Frank book. It's more than just Dodd-Frank. Uh, but it's a really, really good book. But what was Dodd-Frank? So Dodd-Frank came out after 2008, after the crisis, supposed to fix all of this stuff. The question is, did it actually fix anything? Um, it had a massive cost. So yeah, people were, you were hiring a staff of three or four people, especially banks, just to do the Dodd-Frank. Um, it's complex, uh, has a lot of inconsistency. The law that set up America's banking system was 29 pages. The Federal Reserve Law was 32 pages. pages. The Banking Act, Glass-Steagall, was 37 pages. Dodd-Frank was 848 pages long. 848 pages. Who writes? I mean, this is, I'm kind of convinced democracy is failing around the world. Who <laughs> writes 848 pages of a law? And how knowledgeable are the people voting on that law of those 848 pages? Have you thought about that? Who actually writes these laws? Consultants, right? Democratic consultants, Republican consultants. They write the law. Very sophisticated, advanced people. And then they're giving them to people who are mostly what, lawyers or bankers or whatever that may not know any of this stuff. Now, I don't know who's actually running our country, but it's it's not Congress because they're not writing our laws. Somebody else is writing them and they're just... Now, they have big staffs that hopefully, you know, like Bob, you read pages one through 100, Sarah, you read 101 through 200. You hope someone's going through all these pages. I don't know what a typical staff size is for a congressman or congresswoman, but uh, this is tough stuff. And this might not be the only law they have to look at that week. There may be six others. So it's it's amazing. I mean, Medicare, uh, Federal Reserve Act, Banking System Act. I mean, these are massive, massive legislations that were a fraction of what laws are today. Now, I do know a big chunk of that is boilerplate stuff that they copy from other laws and just stick in there. So that's that's probably part of it that they don't have to reread that. The scope and structure was fundamentally different than previous laws. Um, the laws usually provide rules. Dodd-Frank is not directed at people. It's, it's an outline directed at bureaucrats and instructs them to create regulations. So you got a law that doesn't tell banks what to do. You got a law that tells bureaucrats to create rules to tell banks what to do. And that law to create bureaucrats to tell banks what to do is 848 pages and you still banks don't know what to do because the bureaucrats haven't told them yet. That's the law our Congress is passing. Four or five federal agents charged with enacting the rules put forward a 290, okay, we're over a thousand pages now, 298 proposal in the words of a banker, unintelligible any way you read it, includes 383 explicit questions. So you just hired people, right? 
That's what a bank has to do. Someone has to answer all these questions. If you read closely, it breaks down into 1,420 subsections. Um, the interactive vocal rule map Davis Polk has produced its clients is a 355 distinct steps. Any of y'all want to do this for your job? I remember the, the lady at USA, they had do this really great accountant. I thought she was like one of our best employees. She went part-time and that became her 20 hour a week job. And I thought, man, what a waste. That was a really good employee and she's gonna do nothing but enact this one law. I thought, I didn't tell her I thought it was a waste, but she was much more valuable to do other things. Um, it mandates 87 studies. So it's like, hey, here we have a law that we know what we're gonna do, but this law will have other studies. So then we can write more laws, to write more regulations. So, you know, it's just like piling on, piling on. Um, so the other question I ask you is when a thousand banks submit 1,420 sub questions, what's the government going to do? Is someone going to read all of those? Someone going to go, hey, wait, I'm questioning uh, 632 part 2 port 3A. JP Morgan said this, but Chase said, or who's, who's going to handle all of that? So what does the government have to do? They usually hire more people or just stack these things up on a shelf somewhere. Um, the problem is not the reports are, are wrong, it's that no one's looking at them. The big issue isn't about institutions it creates, but how they operate, how much cost. Um, and the big banks are going to get around it just by figuring out how to bend the rules. Lack of clarity. Another problem is it encourages efforts to play the, to play the game, play the, the game to the system. Um, huge costs. Big question though, that it reduced risk. If you read that book on Dodd Frank, they said there was a much easier, simpler way that was actually we can prove statistically was far more effective. Why didn't the government go to the New York Stern and just talk to those guys that wrote the book? That might have made some sense. Um, I tell you, I want to be, I want you to be skeptical, but not cynical. But with our federal government, sometimes cynical is about as good as I can get. It's just, it's, it's a mess. Um, so what does it do? Risk-based capital requirements, leverage limits, liquidity requirements, a resolution plan. So if you do go under, how are you going to handle that? Concentration limits, a contingent capital requirement so that if you, you don't have enough net worth, how are you going to get it? Are you can issue stock, issue something else, more disclosures. Um, but the question was, if Dodd-Frank had been in place in 2006, would 2008 have still happened? And that book says, yeah, it would have still happened. It would have been a, precisely the same as it was. Dodd-Frank didn't fix anything. It just, there's a lot of, uh, you know, smoke and mirrors and a lot of dust, but nothing really. So, yeah, disclosure risk is huge. Our government is not good at it because it's hard to get 500 people to do something complex when they're fighting each other. They come up with something that's going to make sense, that's going to actually going to work. Plus, they're not writing it anyway. The consultants are writing it. So you got to ask the incentives of the consultants. Uh, it's tough. Any question on disclosure risk? I'm not trying to depress you, but just be aware, this is a side of your job in finance. And if you don't plan it well, it's just going to make your life miserable. I managed it pretty well just because I was trying to be a sweet and nice. I mean, I can be sweet and nice when I try I learned that with uh, the executive row, their technicians and secretaries, I mean, I, they were nice people, so I was nice to them, but I, I saw people that just chew them out and they would leave and the secretary would say, yeah, good luck with him getting his meeting. And I was like, yeah, I mean, I wouldn't have given it to you. You got to be nice to people because you need them in finance. Finance, our projects are extra work for other people. You better be nice. You should be nice anyway, right? But you need to be especially nice because your life depends on it. All right, tax risk. We can handle this one pretty quickly. Tax risk is huge as well. Tax risk is there that your project works really, really well before tax and then falls apart after tax. Why is that? Well, because of the timing. You thought two things were going to be taxed in the same period. One gets taxed this this period, the another one gets delayed to a future period. The character, ordinary income versus capital gains, that can be huge. Are the sourcing, is there any international implications? 
Does it get taxed in Europe different than in the U.S.? Those, those type of things. So you have to worry about that. Um, the IRS likes to move gains up and defer losses. They love to do that, and that messes it up. You've got to pay a, a tax on the gain this year, but you don't get the loss. It has to be spread over five years. That's not going to look good. Um, now, you, how do you get around that? So, so this is my big issues with the options. So at USA, I got us in the options. Our options had these massive gains in 2008 because the stock market was down, but we hadn't sold our stock. So we had these massive real gains, realized gains on the options, and we had these huge losses on the stocks, but we hadn't sold them. So what do you do? Well, let's just sell the stocks and buy them back. Can you do that? Sell the stocks, you realize a $500 million loss, you offset against the $500 million gain. Can you do that? What did the note say? We have to wait 30 days to buy it. I think it's 90 days, isn't it? Well, I can't remember. I haven't been in this. But you can't you can't just sell them and buy them back and get the loss because that's called a wash sale. So they won't even think that you even sold them. All right. So this was my big project with the tax department. So I'm talking to this guy and he had every question answered. So I go, well, I know what I'll do. I'll sell all the stocks and I'll buy growth stocks back. I'll just say, you know what? I didn't want core equity. I wanted growth. So right now I'm core. I'm going to sell that and I'm going to buy 40% value, 60% growth. He said, yeah, like you're going to be under oath in the IRS, and they're going to ask you that question, are you going to lie and say the reason you did it was that, re you know, everything I came up with, he said, no, you can't, you can't do that. What if I go small cap, large cap, everything I tried to come up with, there was, there was no solution for that. Um, what was our final solution? He said, let's talk in November. That was our final solution. <laughs> So how did it work out? It worked out perfectly. Why? Well, because 2008 was a kind of a bad year. And actually, I did them a favor because I produced $500 million in gains. And guess what? We had plenty of losses everywhere else in the company. So my gains were actually kind of nice. Because So what we were worried about is I have these gains and we have these losses on stocks. We didn't sell them. But what we didn't think about was have all these other massive losses around the company. So we end up not being an issue, but it could have been an issue. We came to November, it's like, how are we going to fix this? It's going to be pretty tough. So be aware that the IRS, especially with options, the IRS will usually tax options if you have a gain, but will delay losses on options if you have a loss and you have some tough time. So what do you do with options? What I strongly recommend if you're going to trade options is put them in your Roth IRA, put them in your 401k. A Roth IRA is a perfect place for options because you don't really care about gains and losses. It's tax-free. So if you're going to do options, do them in your Roth, and then you know everything else do outside of your Roths. So as much as you can do that, it makes makes life a lot easier. My, my um, interest rate swap was in a pension plan. I didn't care about taxes, because that's completely tax-free. So it was fun. It's like, we can do whatever we want. You can create all the gains you want, all losses, or it doesn't matter. It's in the pension plans. So that was great. It made my life so much easier. But then when I got to the stock portfolio, no, you're a taxable entity. You have to think about those things. But the guy I went to, he was he was on the ball. He knew exactly what we we're doing. And we went through scenarios. What if the stock market falls this much? We make these kind of gains. And, and he knew exactly what he was talking about. Very confident guy. Um, so how do you measure it? Yeah, you, you go through every possible scenario you can think of. You just talk through what you would do. And unfortunately, in this case, we didn't have a solution. We could not think of a solution other than we were lucky we had all these other losses at the time, but we could not think of a solution that would have really, really worked. How do you mitigate it? Again, get to the tax park department early and go through scenarios. You can get an opinion from the IRS. So there are times where you just, in this case, we weren't uncertain. We knew exactly how the tax law worked. But if you're not sure about the tax law, you can go to the IRS and get an opinion. It can be risky to do that, but you, you can do that. Um, and file that away and, and, you know, use it when the time comes. But um, it's possible that you have a great idea that you can't do because of taxes. It just doesn't make sense after taxes and you just have to not do it, unfortunately. All right. I think this is our last risk, right? It's a long one now. Oh, my word. 
All right, so we'll spend, we'll, we'll, we'll be about a class behind or so, that's all right. All right, operational risk, this is a big one because it's everything else. It's all Everything I haven't talked about is in this risk. So you have procedures or policies, they're either not designed well or they're not followed, something goes wrong, you don't have good policies. Um, it could be their internal controls for like theft or rogue trade. What happened in Baltimore this week? The bridge. Does that sound like an operational risk? Absolutely. Whose fault was it? Was it the ship? Was it the bill or the bridge? You know, it's really sad. The guys that that drown. There's probably two more drowned. Very, very, very sad situation. Um, it's insured. I was watching a video. I'm going to show my PNC class next Wednesday. It was insured. So the city is not going to have financial loss because it was well insured, but lives were lost. Um, and I don't know how busy that bridge was, but it's obviously going to disrupt the city. So you're going to sit, go back and sit. Now, if you're in Chicago, what are you asking? We have that same bridge. We have that same issue, right? You're going to be, hopefully that's what they're doing. They're asking that question. One of our alums works in New York and he had to do a risk assessment of the city of New York and he wrote an incredibly excellent paper. I should show it to you. It's really, really good. He, I mean, he went into what if New York has an earthquake? I mean, he was going through every single risk that you think of and it's extremely well written. But that's what every other city should be doing. It's right now stopping and thinking, wow, could this happen to us? What was it? Was it Minnesota that had a big bridge collapse? Remember? I mean, you've seen bridges, right? Infrastructure is a huge issue. Um, there are some bridges. There's a bridge in Orange, Texas. I don't think I would ever drive over. I mean, that thing just looks so dangerous. Um, have you ever been like on I-10 or somewhere? You're on those bridges that are you know, like 50 yards up and you're just flying around. And you're just like, what, what? how well trained was that engineer? Was he having a good week that week? You know, it's we, we put a lot of faith in the people building these um, hiring processes, human resources. Firms are getting sued for not hiring people. Um, uh, you know, USA, I, I'm a really bizarre interviewer. I ask really weird questions, but they wouldn't let me do it. So you can only ask the questions on the page. Well, say, what if their answer brings up another question? And they're like, no, just ask the questions on the page. And I'm like, that's really, really boring. Um, why don't they want me to do that? Because if I ask Cody a question, but I don't ask Alex that question, and Cody gets the job, Alex goes, well, wait, you didn't ask me that question. I would have gotten the job if you'd asked me the question. Uh, I had one firm call me on an employee that was a really difficult employee, and they they wanted a reference. And I said, I, I, I can tell you he worked here. I can't tell you anything else. Why couldn't I say anything else? If I said anything bad about him, you get the job, you can sue, you know, that's the kind of things. So it's human resources is a big one. Reputational risk, we're going to talk about that one a little bit here. Um, one lesson I learned at USA with, um, with some of some of their uh, higher ranking management. Lawsuits, obviously, like tobacco companies. Operational disasters, um, where you're not adequately insured, even when you're insured. How do you measure this? And there's really, this is a tough one to measure. You know. How did Baltimore measure the risk of that bridge coming down? They probably weren't even thinking about it. They had insurance, right? So the insurance companies were managing it. According to the guy from Lloyd's, it was within their realm of what they thought could happen. So they weren't like shocked. This was some for them from an insurance standpoint wasn't a major disaster. They say you see stuff like that in the world all the time. It wasn't as wild. It's obviously sad, but it wasn't from an insurance standpoint. So they have some way of looking at it. These are very, very low frequency events, extremely high severity, and the low frequency, it's so low, it's really, really hard to say. You know, you're talking about terrorist risk. What's the probability of a terrorist event in Chicago? Is it greater than 0%? Is it less than 5%? Who knows? What's the probability of an asteroid hitting us and completely wiping us out? We could probably get put some statistics to that, but you know, 10, 10 miles makes a big difference, you know, so these are really, really tough things to measure. Um, so I, I, I want to talk about close calls because they're pretty, pretty important. So we'll start here on the measurement and we'll spend a little time on operational risk. And I'm going to ask you all some strange questions on next class. So be ready for that.